muted. Sounds yeah, like. for some reason I was in here as Hashi, so I don't know how that happened. Oh. <clears throat> okay, we've got everybody on board here. Uh, 631, welcome. I hope everybody's doing well. I'd like to call to order now the Planning Commission regular meeting of December 6, 2021. The meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Commissioners and city staff are participating from remote locations. All votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash virtual meeting, all one word. Members of the public wishing to speak or defer time to another speaker during the meeting must participate through the Zoom application and must be present in the Zoom conference to be recognized. The city requests that you sign up to speak before the item you would like to speak on has been called by the chair. For those wishing to defer time, you are not required to sign up to speak. Uh, Alex, can you please show the slide we have? Uh, Hold on, sorry about that. We're a little behind here. Okay. Suddenly I was muted. How much did you miss? No, I, I, there. I was locked out. So I heard everything. I just couldn't talk. Okay. Mine was muted for a moment there. I guess you heard most of it or all of it. I got we heard it. up to you. You asked him to put the slide up and then uh, and then you went on mute. Oh, okay, great. Uh, okay, we've got the slide. At the start of the public comment for the item, the chair shall ask the chair shall ask members of the public wishing to defer time to raise their hands in the Zoom meeting using the reaction button, as shown there. Each person will be called to verify their presence in the Zoom meeting and their intent to donate time. Once called upon, please lower your hand in the Zoom meeting. Um, commissioners, when you have comments, please raise your hand, and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. Thank you. So next, I believe we are talking about the approval of the agenda. Nope, you need a roll call. Oh, we need a roll call. Okay, that's not on my list. Uh, who uh, Can we call the roll? Good evening, Commissioners. Commissioner Hi, Jennings? Here. Commissioner Maza? Here. Commissioner Wetton? Here. Vice Chair Smith? Here. Chair Hill? Here. You have a quorum. Okay. Um, approval, John? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve the agenda with item 4A, continue to a date uncertain. Item 5A, continue to January 18th, 2022. And items 4D and 4D, 4E, continue to a special meeting. Excuse me, uh, commissioners. I believe we need to a reporting of the agenda prior to approval of the agenda, if I'm correct. Oh, I thought it was backwards, but go ahead. Oh, maybe it is. Uh, the agenda for this meeting was properly posted on November 22nd, 2001. Okay, great. Now, we're, we're, John just made a motion. Do we have a second for that motion? I'll second it for discussion. We do need to, Chair Hill, we do need to designate um, when the special meeting would be if we're going to, unless we want to continue a date uncertain and then have uh, the have the planning director um, um, seek to set up a, a date for a special meeting and then do it. Okay, I'd like to hear from uh, Richard on what he wants to do. Certainly. <clears throat> if it's the commission's will, we can set up a special meeting. Correct me if I'm wrong, Patricia for January 11th, 12th, or 13th. Is that correct? That's correct. Those are the dates that we have available for staff and IT. What days of the week is that? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. Well, I, I, I to, for the discussion purposes, I'd just like to say that I have twice as many notes tonight as I've ever had. Uh, and this is a really complex agenda. On the particular items that John has called out there, I know there's a lot of um, uncertain information and some new information that I know staff that has not fully processed yet. So um, 
I think to to really give it what it's due, uh, to really hear all the aspects of it, it's worth having a special meeting so we can really focus in on the details. I'm open all three days. Me too. Anybody else? Does I'm good. Have a preference. Uh, I'd prefer a Tuesday just to get it done with uh, J uh, Commissioner Jennings. No, well, it's it's like putting off a root canal, but um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but we're we're already pulling several teeth here tonight already. So I think the thought is let's and and I say this having just had a couple crowns done a couple days ago. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, okay, I I that's all I have to say. Is everybody okay with the 11th? And I'll make a motion for the 11th. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, well, Craig has to accept the prior motion. Uh, yeah, I'll accept it. Okay. So. Uh, to, to, clar to, to clarify, if I may, Chair Hill. Yes. The the, uh, the motion then is to approve the agenda as uh, recommended by staff with the uh, with the change of items 4D and 4E continued to a special meeting to be noticed for January 11th, 2022. Um, yeah, yes, two comments. Um, well, one is that part of the rationale is that we have residents on the agenda tonight, too. So it'd be nice to not kick any of them off if, if we can avoid it. And secondly, um, does it necessarily have to be re-noticed or what, what is the, the noticing requirements on this? It, if we continue it to a date and time certain. So that was my next question was uh, what time the meeting would be. Would it be at 630, Richard? I would hope it is because the public wants to weigh in on this. Yeah. I believe, Patricia, what I believe I read earlier today was 6.30. Is that correct? Correct. 6.30 p.m. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Mazza, then does that uh, reflect your motion then, the staff's recommendation, and then with items 4D and 4E continued to a special meeting to be set for January 11th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m.? Does that reflect your motion? Yes, it does. I would also like to request that staff deliver us the final uh, staff report as soon as they can before the meeting, not not just the Friday before. It's that thick. Okay, but that is my motion. And Chair Hill, that's like your second. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm following along. Uh, did I hear something about item 5B moving as well? No. No. Okay. What is it? <laughs> the 5B was the fire rebuild? No. No, I think the thought was if we move this, then we'd get to those things sooner and, and more completely. Maybe. 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 <laughs> Commissioner Jennings? Yes, I'd just like staff to um, make it clear on the uh, on 4D, the, uh, the uh, JUPA. Um, I'm assuming that the owners of the property wouldn't want the joint use property uh, uh, parking agreement to be modified if the motel were not approved. Is that correct? Because that seems to me to be a pointless exercise. And, and, and so we've had this discussion earlier about which one do we decide first? Do we decide the one or decide yeah. the other? If you could just, not necessarily now, but if you could just clarify for us before we get to that meeting how we should handle that problem. Yeah, a quick quick comment from John. Yes. Uh, last meeting when we discussed this, it was the other way around. I think we should continue that. We've already done half of that. And I think Jeff is completely right. Uh, we don't want to change the CUPA and then then they'll have to come back again and change it again if we don't approve uh, the other one. Yeah, we can we can settle this th through some discussion in the coming days and, and get it sorted by the time we get there with staff. Okay. Yeah, I, trust, I trust you. Let's vote. Um, yeah, let's call the roll. Yes. Commissioner Mazza? Oh. Yes. Vice Chair Smith? Uh, yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, Chair Hill, yes. I just want to make sure the public knows what we did because we're talking 4A, 4B, and they know it as the Malibu Motel and Malibu Inn. So I, I hope everybody here understands if you're here for those 
hearings. They're not going to happen tonight, and you can go out and celebrate. Thank you for the clarification. Um, are we on to item 2A public comment? I believe we are. Yeah, to clarify uh, what Commissioner Madison said, it is items 4D and 4E that deal with the Malibu and Hotel property and the one next door. Um, okay. Uh, Patricia, what do we have in the way of public comment? We have one second, please. We have four speakers signed up for item 2A public comments. Um, I would like to start Melissa Bowden. She signed up to speak for um, multiple items tonight. If it's possible to find out what um, items she intended to speak on, would it be possible to call her first? That sounds helpful, yeah. Melissa? Are you there? Is she unmuted? Okay. I, I don't see her in the meeting. Do you, Patricia? I do not. We'll start go back if we see her again. Okay. Good plan. Um, okay. Uh, we could start with Dana Bird. Item 2A, public comments. Hi, Dana. Are you there? I also don't see a Dana Bird. Uh, could I make a quick comment? Yeah. Since we've continued the motel, uh, people who want to speak on it in general comment can speak. It, it, yeah. Uh, it, at the end of, of the ones that signed up, then I believe Chair Hill will ask if anybody else wants to speak and they can raise their hand. Right. So if anybody's out there still wanting to comment, uh, we'll get to you at the end of this cycle. Um, who's next, Patricia? Um. Dr. Joseph Hanno Vickian. And if your name is called, please uh, click the raise hand to help us locate you. Dr. Hanno Vickian, are you there? Is he in the meeting? No, we don't see him. Um, I, I see a raised hand from Scott Dietrich. Is he uh, listed or do you want to stick him on the back? He's listed right now under public comments. We could get through one more speaker and then perhaps um, get to Scott Dietrich. Sounds good. Uh, lastly, we have Ryan Embry. Okay. Ryan, you'll be there. You here? Uh, yeah, don't say something you might regret. Um, my... Uh, the question has to do with all of the conditional use permits that uh, the city inherited from Los Angeles County, which um, had expiration dates on them, and the city needs to track the um, conditions and the appropriateness of those permits, uh, the parking requirements and so forth, because we're getting into parking requirements on multiple projects here. And it's pertinent what the original conditions were and required. And in particular, there's a restaurant off in eastern Malibu that had a uh, parking lot on, I think, some adjacent lots. And the parking lot fell in in their, some time in the early 2000s. They lost their parking, continued to operate as if nothing changed. And then there was a, a terrible accident that occurred on PCH. The city was sued. It went to joint powers. We were working our way out of that. And the issue was the parking. And when we have um, insufficient parking and compact parking that never seems to work, or, um, we need to address this, especially in new development proposals. So first of all, I think you've decided to get rid of compact parking for any of these uh, joint use agreements. But that doesn't necessarily apply to the existing parking that might remain when you're talking about joint use. So there's a lot of joint use proposals before you coming up. And I think they need to cure the deficient parking before they try to uh, parcel off a few spaces to an adjacent or a nearby parcel for, for the other use. Uh, we're losing track that there may not be enough parking to begin with. And the other conditions, which I don't know what they all are, 
But there was a matrix developed and an estimate uh, by the planning department uh, many years back, uh, six, seven, eight, of the number of properties that need to be worked and phased in and so forth. That project is is unfulfilled. It needs to be addressed. And I don't know how the best way to do that, if you need to hire a consultant to, to handle it uh, or do it in-house. But I wanted to bring that back to the commission's attention um, that those are conditional use permits that are the purview of the city's planning commission. And I currently are uh, expired and no longer compliant. So um, as it relates to any of the properties that are coming before you, that information needs to be included. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, who do we have next? We have no other speakers listed in. Um, Why don't we try Scott? Online, but let's go. Yes, let's go to the hands raised if there are any. Thank you, commissioners. I had intended on speaking to item 4E, um, but I guess now that's uh, January 11th. And I think that was a great idea to, uh, to move it to have a special meeting. I'm very concerned that the public just is not aware of how this will impact Malibu, how it will change things right at the center of our city in a way. Um, and I don't know what the best way to publicize this is, but I, I do think we need to publicize it. Um, a couple things, I, I agree with Ryan. I think he's raised the parking issue with this new motel and taking away existing parking right where it's really crowded to begin with, with the pier and everything going on around that. Um, the other thing that very much bothers me is that when Norm's Hotel was before uh, council, um, he was contributing a great deal of money. He was contributing um, to our water system. And I don't see anything that is commensurate with this project. And I wonder why. Um, that, that seems to be lacking. And, and remember, Norm's Hotel was an existing building that limited everything. This is not. This is new construction. So somehow I think we need to get the word out to let the folks of Malibu know what's going on. Uh, appreciate your work on all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Patricia, do we can we circle back now? Or are there other hands? You have a hand. Oh, I see Joe Drummond. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I was actually also going to speak on 4D&E, and I guess my, my question is, um, on in September 8th, you guys had asked if the the fundamentally different project that uses four times more water than the original project can be approved in a water band area. That's what I was hoping that would be. I, and I didn't ever get an answer on that. And I did call the water quality board today and left them a message letting them know that this was originally a retail operation. And now it's going to a motel where the fixture count gone from 56 to 229, which is a stark increase. So I just, wanted to know and that also could the digging into the slope and could decrease the slope of stability further i just want to make sure that the water quality board has been notified and if they are if they ever got a response about it or the water control quality control board that's it all right thank you joe um patricia i can't see the uh time for the speakers um so far it hasn't been significant but i don't see a clock no, uh -huh. I would have to enter them in so we could pause between each person. If you would like for me to do that, I can enter them in and start the clock. I don't feel the need, but if okay. if that's required for some procedural thing, I don't I know. I do have a manual timer um, to ensure that people are within their three minutes. That sounds that sounds good. We appear to be done with the speakers anyway. Yeah, is is there anybody uh, in the meeting now that wasn't then? <clears throat> I don't believe so. Okay. 
All right, well then let's move on to um, commissioner comments. Um, who'd like to go first? I don't, I don't see, I only see, there we go. Ah, Dennis, I see your hand there. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, watching uh, the council over hearing it the other night, um, you know, the, the underground in, and the power and all the things that happened and our phone's not working and T-Mobile being the only one that worked, a uh, lot, lot, of, lot of stuff there. So with, with the undergrounding, I, I, I feel pretty doggone qualified to give you the information that I'm going to because uh, although I did read Lois Lyons was pretty close in some of the things that she wrote, I, was, uh, I thought that was really good. I, I read some of the things she had said. But for the, for the most part, you guys, we're, we're really going to, we're going to be dodging everything when we're digging. So if you're going to start digging this monumental trench, we're going to be dodging mostly gas and water. Um, you know, when you get into some of these neighborhoods, a lot of the people have brought their yards all the way into the right of way. And when that happens, they have, they're going to have the option and they'll have time to figure that out. They'll have the option to get out of all of the way or the utility companies or whoever's doing the work will take it out. And they will not be, the homeowner will not be reimbursed you are in a public right of way. You're in a utility easement. So when that happens, that'll make everybody angry, of course. And you're gonna have to deal with a lot of crap in the trench. You know, you can't have debris and uh, anything in the trench. So all the roots and everything's gonna have to be cleaned. And I'm, trust me, when I give you the number at the end, you're gonna get the idea here. So. You're going to have, there's going to be so much that has to be done here, uh, but that's going, that's going to be a big issue. Um, also, uh, you know, as, a, as, an, as an example, you know, my road to Tuna Canyon that I built, that's a 40-foot utility easement going all the way up there. So that road's 3,522 feet long, and when you put all the water lines and my gas line and all the cable and everything in there, and you figure all the underground, each individual item that goes in there, in that 3,522 3, feet, you've got almost 25 miles of underground. You've got almost 25 miles just in there, okay? That's just everything. That's everything that we need to make our lives work here in town. So kind of getting the picture. You know, I've done a lot of this kind of work in my career. You know, I put in a lot. I've done a lot of grading and sewer and water. You know, I obviously I was in the corporate site for many years. Um, I've cable phone reclaimed everything. And um, I've been involved with enough underground, you guys, that you can get to the moon and you can pass the moon with how much I've put underground. I put well over 200,000 miles of everything in the ground. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching everybody un think that we can just go underground, which would be wonderful if we could, and you can, but it's gonna be killer. Um, you have to understand that uh, it's gonna be a lot of money, and that lot of money is about $850 million. And if you're lucky, we can maybe save a buck or two. I know that Mr. Letts was coming in at about three million a mile. I think we're probably four. That's like the first, that'd be going from the Tuna Canyon to our 27 miles or 21 to somebody, but 27 to us. And that's about 108 million right there. And that's if, you know, anybody wasn't in the way and you weren't dodging a water line. And the other thing that happens, you guys, when you have to jump from one side of the street to the other for the power, you can't, there, Caltrans is not gonna let you slot cut that street. You gotta bore under like I did for the water. But when I bored under for the water, that turned out to be almost $550,000 for me to do that. So keep these numbers in mind. That wasn't easy. We hit a rock. Rock came up in the road. I, we had a traffic thing. It was quite a night. I came before council, apologized to the city. That happened. We had no idea, of course, that was going to happen. My point is, it's a lot of money and it's a lot more than anybody, except for those in the business, would have an idea of what it's gonna take. And would it be wonderful? Damn right. Do we have 850? Do we have to figure out a way to do it? We all know that 
Edison's already been sued a couple of times for $850 million, and hell, they could have done it the first time, right? So I don't know how we come up with the money. If there's, uh, if there's any money left from, from the money that we're all paying for in Washington, D.C., if the state of California could help us, if there's all the ways that we need. But that's a number for you right there. And um, that's, a, that's a good jumping off point. And, there, and it's just going to be a nightmare to do that work. Okay. But it's possible. All right. Uh, you more, more on that or more on something else, Dennis? Um, no, I just think I think just on the power outages, I think, um, you know, Verizon and whatnot. I drove from my place here at Trancas up to uh, the Jehovah Witness place because I knew there's a generator there because Ryan Embry had said there's a generator there. And sure as heck, it's running. But for T-Mobile, not Verizon. T-Mobile <laughs> and Mint were all working in our town, not Verizon. So yeah. I have definite thoughts about that, but, and I know we have a long meeting tonight, you guys, but nothing was brought up the other night about what it's really going to do or what yeah. it takes for us to underground. Well, we, we don't have this agendized, but maybe something when we have a little bit more staff, we could think about having some kind of special community workshop or meeting where people could learn about it, bring a little bit of research, uh, get get the process going in some way. But let, let's not get into detail on that now, but let's just consider that, uh, if anything's going to happen, we need to reach some kind of critical mass to move it forward. John? Yeah, I just want to comment a little bit on what Dennis said. It is absolutely true that numbers, his numbers are probably very low. Um, 11 years ago, I tried to underground Zumarez, which is 38 houses. It's flat. That's a huge difference if you're in the mountains or if it's flat. 11 years ago, the price from the was $3 million plus a million for um, uh, cable and phone line, an extra million. They, they get you too. Uh, now that's not counting the hookup charges. You as a homeowner pay those. You have to run from underground to your house underground. A substantial cost. And when you're talking four or 5,000 houses, that gooses the number higher. So these are very high numbers. The other thing I want to point out is I can't remember how many fires we ever had in Malibu that started within Malibu. Um, and, of course, that's our only jurisdiction to do this. Uh, I can remember the fire at Bluffs Park. Other than that, they mostly started over the hill. Where you're talking high-tension lines and Simi Valley and all this stuff. So the utility of it is only partial. People think if the wires spark, they're going to spark in Malibu. Not necessarily. Now, I uh, I do. I have a lot of property in Laguna Beach. At the present time, Laguna Beach is undergrounding every single wire on Coast Highway under a grant. Okay? They're also putting in a 150-foot wide fire break for the whole town which is about 12 miles, also on a grant. They're also rebuilding every sidewalk on Coast Highway, which is about 22 miles of sidewalks, on a grant. So they're being proactive. I've turned the information over to Don Schmitz to look into because he's been working on this for years, and I don't have the time. Um, but... You know, fixes, uh, fixes that come out of local TV station or something aren't necessarily what you need to know. You need to know the real facts. Um, now, at some other meeting, I want to discuss the fiasco at uh, Westford Beach hearing and, and who gets to comment on, on projects being built. And who understands the Coastal Commission and who doesn't and who knows the codes? I got a letter from one, a memo from one of the public works commissioners who had facts totally incorrect, never read the staff report. And so I hope at some point we figure out who knows what's going on and we don't have these kind of fiascos. The other thing I want to point out very quickly to, the, oh, I want to comment on um, Ryan also. Um, we're 32 years old, the city. 
And about, we were supposed to after, I think we had a 10 or 10 year limit on, on checking our CUPs. And we found out that we didn't have it in a lot of cases. And the city council punted and said, oh, we'll deal with them when they come up. Well, that was quite a while ago. So in a lot of cases, most people don't realize these businesses are operating without any CUP. And at some point, we have to become a real city and do things the way real cities do it. Um, now, I know that takes a lot of staff time, and we don't have it now, but we ought to do it. Um, the uh, And then we ought to look into CUPs that, that, are, that have come before us and are in violation, and we've had hearings on. For example, Nobu, for example, Beau Rivage. We had hearing after hearing, and then all of a sudden, they disappeared. We were supposed to get a report back on Beau Rivage. It's now a private club. Uh, we, it's been 10 years since the CUP has been in violation on Nobu, and we still have a traffic mess. So we have to clean up the problems we have before we create any more. And I, the last thing is I just wanted to show the public. I'm not trying to blow any of our horns here, but we need to have our staff be realistic about what we can have at meetings. We have the public coming to meetings, getting all revved up, doing research, and then we, we move it to the next meeting. And we've done it on one of these projects tonight, I think, two times. And I just want to show you what our staff report was this, this week. Don't get a hernia. That's it, okay? That's it's about, I estimated about 3,000 pages and a whole bunch of other stuff, plus about 50 letters to look at, some of which are lawyer letters, which are eight pages long. So, and then you have to go do it again, again, twice, three times, go through it all, because it all changes. So I think we have to be realistic about how much can be done in a meeting and, and just not continue things, just be realistic. And maybe we have to prioritize who gets scheduled, but um, the homeowners cannot sit out there and not be getting their permits and having commercial projects come along and bump them out of the way time and time again. So that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, anybody else? I'll just make one uh, quick comment. Okay. Uh, I just like to say that I think it's a great idea to uh, let the public know about the Malibu Inn project. It's a project of significance. I don't know what the Malibu Times is doing in the new ownership in terms of covering. For example, is there anybody in the meeting from the Malibu Times tonight? Do we know? Um, anyway, I think, so. I think it's, uh, you know, if, if not, we should see what we can do to get, get our meetings covered so that we can get the word out on this stuff. That's all I've got. Okay. Commissioner Jennings, I saw your hand there. You're muted. No, still muted. Sorry, 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 sorry. There you um, go. Yeah. In response to Ryan, um, uh, county in most cases didn't require a CUP. So when uh, the records were, were came over, uh, the question was raised back in the uh, council and the council says, well, let's see, uh, 10 years, everybody's got to have a CUP. And then the 10 years ran out and everybody said, oh, we're going to have to close down all these businesses because nobody has a CUP. And the council said, we don't think that's a great idea. So we're going to deal with them on a case by case basis. But that's how that came up. I don't think that uh, Ryan was talking about taking over CUPs that came from the county. Um, my memory is that the county didn't require CUPs. Uh, secondly, for Scott Dietrich, um, talking about how come Norm had to give a bunch of money and the Malibu, uh, in the Malibu, what's it called? The Malibu Hotel, Motel, uh, didn't. The reason is that, that, uh, Norm's project, uh, was a development agreement and excluded, it, it exceeded the allowable FAR. And so it was basically 
uh, a, a, an arrangement by which uh, uh, the development agreement was approved, which was involved paying a lot of money. This project, the Malibu, whatever it is, um, Malibu Rim Motel, doesn't uh, have the same conditions and, and doesn't require that kind of development agreement. Uh, and as far as uh, Joe Drummond had to say with respect to the Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, I raised that question the last time we were here. And then looking at the staff report for tonight, uh, it occurred to me that uh, if the project were to obtain planning approval, we would have to go back in front of the Regional Water Quality Control Board. So uh, if it turned out that, gee, uh, it doesn't uh, qualify as uh, under whatever it was, table 4XX, um, then it would be stuck and be not able to do anything until the uh, undergrounds were put in. So uh, the utilities from the, the sewer system. So um, I, those are my comments with regard to the public speakers. Okay, thank you. I, I've got a few things. Um, on Brian's comment about past CUPs, it sounds like maybe that's something for planning to get together with code enforcement and sort out whose responsibility is what. Um, that's just a question for now. Uh, I think the special meeting, there is an opportunity there for some publicity about it. And the fact that it's special, maybe people will show up because they won't feel like they have to wait three hours before we get to the item. Um, now that Joe Drummond has called the, the water board on this, I think staff, it's probably a good idea to get out in front of it and, uh, uh, you know, weigh in with your side, lest, lest they be taking the ball and running it in some unforeseen, foreseeable direction. So I think it's time to stop guessing and, and, and get together with them. Um, uh, okay. Um, I think we've talked about this in, at different layers at different times, but staff I know is thinking about coming up with some revamped policies uh, through the council about, for example, how to handle uh, code violations that are coming for after the fact permits and uh, one thought I have, not related to that directly, but also to look at, are there ways to make it easier to get permits for smaller things, whether it's just a foot and a half high retaining wall or putting your air conditioner somewhere, um, or um, we, we, I've seen a, a deck this week that's low to the ground and um, not, it's only 60 square feet, and it's, and it's looks like it's requiring a lot of permit and geology and so forth. And so it seems like there's a, the, the curve of permits should be more parabolic in the sense that the things at the low end should be easier and maybe things at the high end, like if you're going to build a 10 or 11,000 square foot house, maybe there's a premium somehow because it's not a, a family house, it's an investment commodity. Um, Similarly, maybe the code enforcement fines should be adjusted and be a little more parabolic. So the first fine is, is pretty low and just a slap on the hand and you didn't know better. But if you do repeated offenses, the fines should stack up much higher more quickly so that the true offenders can feel it. Um, a couple of thoughts about commission process. Um, I think on some items, we get mired in discussing multiple issues at once and kind of going back and forth and around and trying to talk about three or four things at a time. I think maybe it would be helpful to just conceptually to distinguish between times when it's important to just put out a quick bullet list of things like, you know, on here are the six or eight things that I think are issues on this project. Bam, 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 bam. And then there are times when we just have to say, let's, okay, let's do one thing at a time. So that, that's just something to think about. Um, as a matter of protocol, I don't know how feel, people feel about formalities. I don't feel like I need to be called Chair Hill. I feel like it would be a lot easier when we're really going if I can just go, you know, John, Dennis, Mark, whatever, instead of saying Commissioner Jennings, Commissioner, no, no, no. I don't know. But on the other hand, people, your titles are meaningful, and, and um, it's, it's, it's nice to hear yourself called that way maybe. And so I'm, I'm just wondering about how formal people People want things to be or care if I just call you by your first name, if that's an issue. And maybe you don't even have to tell me tonight. Um, and then on disclosures, I wondered, 
we have to disclose when we talk to members of the public. We have to disclose when we've talked to one other commissioner on an item. I think we should probably have to disclose when we've talked to our council member, if we've said anything substantive with them and if they've given us any thoughts about where they would like to see a vote go. I think that, that that's, in, uh, I, I don't understand why we wouldn't make that disclosure once I thought of this idea. And uh, we might even want to be able to make an affirmative, no, I haven't discussed this item with my council member. So um, I guess that's a question for everybody about how, how transparent you would want to make that, given that we have to make disclosures about everybody else we talk to. And, uh, oh, final comment on the public um uh, we got an email about putting staff initials on staff reports. I don't know if this is trivial, whether it's relevant, but someone was wound up that recent staff reports haven't had sign-offs on them. And Richard, maybe you could explain about whether and why that's relevant or not. So I guess I've left two questions out here now. That for Richard now, and then let's go back and pick up the question about how much, if at all, do we want to disclose or communicates with council. Go ahead, Richard. Sure. To answer the question about the signatures, uh, like you used to see on the reports, that was something that was just a staff practice. And there is no requirement in the code that there be a signature on it. And the reason for the change uh, was COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, because in, during COVID, we went from uh, a lot of us in the office to switching to almost a paperless. I know that sounds funny considering the, the pile of paper uh, that, you, uh, that uh, Commissioner Mazza just showed uh, the public, but we do everything digitally. Uh, the, the, the packets come to me uh, or they come to Adrian, to, to both of us. And when we get them, it's a, a digital working file that we go through, we review it. Uh, you know, if it's a council report with an appeal, something like that usually goes to our city attorney's office. We do it all digitally. And so as part of that switch, the, the, the handwritten initials were dropped from the report. But uh, these reports are peer reviewed and checked. Um, and I also believe that the same is uh, true. Correct me if I'm wrong, Patricia, but I believe the same is true of how the city council packets are published. I don't believe there are signatures on there either. That's correct. They omit signatures and the entire packet is processed digitally as well. And then also, uh, Chair Hill, I understand your comment about where the department involves itself. Um, you know, we, we do follow the work plan as given to us by the city. Uh, when it comes to when a development permit is required and not required, we fall back on Municipal Code Section 1762.030. And uh, in that section, as trivial as it may sound, it says patios, decks, and trellises uh, require approval by the city. Uh, so we, you know, we'll, we could definitely look at it to see some way to try to make that a bit easier. But unfortunately, uh, we, we do have to, to review that. And then the last thing that I'll say, and then let Trevor or, uh, or the other commissioners jump in there on the comment, uh, the question you posed was I want to remind all the commissioners that this coming Friday at 1.30, there will be a special city council meeting and it is the Brown Act training. Are we supposed to go to that? Yes, this is a planning commission training as well. So it's for all of our, our commissions. So that'll be putting on, that's a, a great entree. Uh, Chair Hill, if you don't mind, I, I'd be happy to respond to your other question. Oh, you know, let, let, let me just first real quickly to Richard and, and part of the point about reducing the intensity at the low end is just if if it's easy enough to get a permit and not expensive enough more people will be encouraged to do that and there'll be maybe less bootlegging going on so that, that's part of the rationale okay go ahead trevor really understand sure i was just going to say um there's no difference there's no special you know commissioner council member privilege so you're falling under the, the regular rules for disclosures and we don't have an agendized item so we can't get into a big debate about this but it is something that we could discuss at the Brown Act training, that'll be one thing that we'll be going through, you know, on Friday. So um, let's do that. Put put a pin in that and let's talk about it then. Yeah, John. Real quick, Trevor, you're saying that the uh, a, uh, city council member is no different than the public. There's no special privilege between the council member and the, and, and the person that they appoint. 
Okay. Um, special privileges Friday, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, I think we're on to our first substantive item. If there are no more comments. Uh, that would be uh, item 4B, Merritt Drive. Uh, I don't have the, I'm going to have to go grab the list in front of me. Uh, does somebody want to read out the full description on that one? Greg, you you skip staff comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Speak up. Staff. Uh, Richard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No, I uh, snuck my comment in there, which was, uh, the reminder about the Brown Act training this coming Friday. So thank you. I appreciate that, but uh, no further comments at this time. Well, we appreciate the brevity then. Um, does somebody have the exact description in front of them? I'm, otherwise, I'll just have to run into the other room for three seconds. I was just going to say there is one other. Um, okay. Uh, one other <laughs> um, note that we want to just uh, give out to the commission. Uh, today is DDA's last planning commission meeting. Um, as he is leaving the city. So um, he does have an item today, um, but we wanted to uh, thank him for his time with the city. And uh, we appreciate his almost four years of working with the city. So we just want to say thank you to him. Yeah, thank you, DDA. Very good. Ah, oh, DDA. Thanks. Have fun in Calabasas. <laughs> uh, Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's let let us move on. Does, does somebody have the description on 4B Merit Drive? I can, I can read it for you. 4B, okay, thank you. Coastal Development Permit Number 19-078 and de Demolition Permit Number 21-020, an application to demolish a single-family residence and associated development and construct a new single-family residence and associated development continued from November 1, 2021. Location, 6400 Merritt Drive. Thank you, John. Um, do we have a presentation from the applicant? Well, you have a presentation from staff. Um, oh, from staff, the, right. Yeah. Staff first, I'm sorry. Not a problem. Uh, good evening, Chair Hill and members of the Planning Commission. I am presenting this project on behalf of David Ng, uh, the case planner for the project before you. Uh, this project was... Last review at the November 1st Planning Commission meeting, at which time it was continued to tonight's meeting. Uh, next slide, please. The property is located in the Malibu West neighborhood uh, near Zuma Beach. Um, as highlighted in this area photograph, the property fronts Pacific Coast Highway to the south, but takes access from Merritt Drive. Uh, next slide. Uh, the parcel is currently developed with a single family house and garage that were originally constructed in 1956. As illustrated in this uh, area photo um, of the property, the project is cited among other similar developed parcels with single family homes and uh, similar accessory structures. Uh, next slide, please. The project includes the demolition of the existing house and construction of a new one-story single-family residence with a basement, um, garage, studio, a second uh, residential unit, a pool cabana, uh, and uh, for a total of 8,546 square feet of uh, TDSF or total development square footage. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, other new construction include two swimming pools and spa, uh, outdoor clay tennis court, new driveway turnaround and uncovered guest parking, uh, septic system and landscaping. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in this site plan, uh, existing development is depicted on in solid gray shading uh, overlaid with a slope analysis. Uh, the existing and proposed develop, development are concentrated in the central portion of the parcel on slopes that are flatter than four to one. Uh, the southwest uh, portion of the parcel is characterized by an inland bluff and the sands uh, down from uh, towards Pacific Coast Highway. At the uh, prior uh, planning commission meeting, there were questions about the location of the top of bluff and the justification for the reduced uh, bluff top setback. Uh, as discussed in the staff report for tonight's uh, hearing, uh, the city's geotechnical consultant um, 
uh, uh, the consultant uh, confirms his location as shown here. Uh, the bluff does not include a narrow swath of 2.5 uh, or 2.5 to 1 slopes, uh, which is shown in magenta on this map, uh, that, um, and appears to be uh, just to the north side of the 1 to 1 slopes, uh, which were um, the portions of the slopes that were identified as uh, the bluff. After a geo uh, geotechnical analysis, uh, confirm a factor of safety greater than 1.5, 1 1 excuse me, uh, and approval by the city's geotechnical consultant, the bluff setback is allowed to be reduced uh, to 50 feet. Uh, one of the proposed uh, swimming pools has, has been set back to meet the minimum required of 50 feet, and the uh, new dwelling outlined in red uh, will be located further inland than uh, the previous uh, residents on the existing property. Uh, next slide. The site plan shows the location of the main buildings and uh, structures proposed uh, on the subject uh, property. Uh, next slide. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, uh, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the proposed project with conditions. The city geotechnical consultants are here to answer any questions you may have regarding the bluff or the bluff setback. Uh, for any other questions, uh, the uh, applicant team and staff is here to answer your questions. Thank you. You're muted, Commissioner Chair Hill. Aha, uh -huh. thank you, Adrian. Uh, commissioners, do you have any quick questions for staff? I have a quick uh, comment. John? At the last meeting, we went over this and we sent back staff questions. And in my reading of this and quoting from the staff report on page one of four, the application has made no changes to the project and, and previously submitted plans. And I can see not one word of difference between this staff report and the last one, other than the fact that it says, geotechnical staff said it was okay. Basically one sentence. And I do not think that's proper. Uh, we sent back, as for questions to be answered. They're not in the staff report, as far as I can tell. Okay, we can go on. I'm just stitching. <laughs> okay. um, any other questions for staff? Anybody? I, I just have one that um, in the last meeting, Richard, with regard to the bluff edge, the definition of what is the actual edge of the bluff, you had said that you would be talking with Yolanda. I'm not sure why Yolanda, but that was something that uh, in terms of getting together about the definition of where the break is from the flat plane on the top of the bluff to when it starts down the hill. Is that so? The the reason why uh, the consultation with our building official is that, and this is I'm sure is something that is going to come up on the bird view uh, property as well. Um, we the reason why Yolanda was brought into it is because she is the director that oversees the city's geotechnical staff. Um, whenever and Adrian, feel free to jump in if I miss anything that you feel like. like uh, should be added to this. Whenever staff looks at a, a bluff edge, um, we, the planning department makes an opinion as well as our, our city geotechs are, are part of that as well. And in general, uh, when working with Christopher Dean in the past, you know, we've looked at a, a bluff as the, where the topography falls away to a precipitous slope and precipitous meaning steep. And so we did look at this a second time. And I think part of the problem here is the way the, the color photocopier reproduced the colors on the color coded slope analysis, because it does show that there's that, I think we want to call it a step that was mentioned in the last meeting. There is a slope from that flat area. The slope analysis identifies a slope. And then we got the flat area of the building pad. 
And I recall that the commission wanted to move that line to the top of that, um, that slope that's shown on the slope, slope map uh, that's between the, we'll see all of the topography going to the ocean and, and where the, build, the building is on the land side. Um, under further investigation, and I can look for the exact slope category unless Adrian has it in front of him, but we realized that that color is very close to the steep slope colors. And uh, we, our, the planner, the project planner also visited the site again to, or looked at his site photos to confirm uh, from what he had when he went out there. And there's a slope, but it is not a, a steep slope, it, kind of a blend between that that flat area there, the step, and the building pad. However, you know, the, the final decision maker here is the, the planning commission. Uh, but in our opinion, uh, based off of how we've looked at bluffs in the past, um, it was not steep enough to warrant us moving the bluff line further seaward uh, in our recommendation. Well, let, let me get ask you here, and I'll, I'll do, do it now so the applicant has an opportunity to respond too. But it, um, your definition of where the slope becomes precipitous doesn't seem to, to my eye to match what the LIP says, how it defines a bluff edge, where it says expressly, and you just used the word step. It says, in a case where there is a step-like feature at the top of the cliff face, the landward edge of the topmost riser shall be taken to be the bluff edge. So what, what that's missing is any discussion of how wide is the step, or you know how deep or what, but but just on its face, that would seem to suggest you you start where the lot has been flat all the way across, and once it starts down, that's the bluff edge. I'm pulling up the definition myself to look at it. It as I mentioned, it's it has been the city's practice that we look for a steep slope. And we also look at, <clears throat> it's not a factor of the step. The, when I use the word the step, that's to describe what it looks like there. Um, there is a slope that transitions between the, the step and the bluff. Uh, however, because of the steepness of it, um, it does not, you know, it, it doesn't appear to really be part of that bluff. Because when you look at this property uh, from aerial photos or as the planner did on site from PCH, uh, you see a steep drop off. And the characteristic of that slope that's there doesn't also match that steep drop off. And with the code, his intention is to focus on the steep drop offs. And if you have a steep drop off step, steep drop off, I agree with you completely. Uh, but where you have a, 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 a something that's really not meeting the definition of a steep slope, just, uh, you know, descending grade, uh, because, you know, a, you know a five, our, our slope analysis are picking up five to one slopes, which is one foot of change over five feet. And even something that seems steep, like three, three to one, that is not considered a bluff. Three feet over a three foot, a one foot change over three feet. So you know, it, if uh, I can briefly summarize your position, it's that a the step that is on the site is not enough of a step to meet the definition of a step as in the code. So that because it, you're saying it's, it's really just not a step. It, it's not the, it, it, it's not. The, the step itself, it's the, we're looking at the, the category of slope between the building pad and that step, because, you know, that's the key factor for me. And I think Adrian would also agree to that. It, it's, we're looking for when you stand somewhere on that property, where does it start dropping off in a steep fashion? And in the case of this, the steep fashion would be on the, the seaward uh, where the line's drawn, seaward of that step. Had there been a steep drop step, steep slope, uh, or steep drop, then we would be definitely moving that line more landward. Okay. Uh, well, we okay. We can we can mull that. I think let let's hear from the applicant. Well, I want to add something to that. Oh, John, quickly. Okay. Uh, in looking at the plans and the staff report, it says it has been prior. It was prior graded, and there is a. Um, A, uh, a, a, re a retaining wall, essentially, to hold it up. 
okay, that's not a natural slope. That's been built. And and to remediate what, well, where the bluff used to be. Uh, it's been bulldozed down, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's right on the plans. Um, so once you bulldoze something, you got to go back to the original. You can't just say, oh, gee, they made it three to one, and so no, it's no longer the top of the bluff. And, and I don't know how we, we just ignore that. The applicant has some historical aerial photos uh, that I believe they are ready to present um, to you uh, that will show what the topography was like at the time the house was built in 56. But also, if we can go back to my presentation for a second, uh, we do have a cross section that shows the slope. Maybe that will uh, shed, some light, uh, shed some light into what we're talking about. Okay, well, I don't want to get too far into this because there's all kinds of stuff about this slope and, and stability and this pool requiring. But, but why, don't, why, don't, why don't we put a pin in this now? We can hear from the applicant, and then if something hasn't been answered yet, we can go back and look at, at your, uh, Adrian, your thing. That's fair. Okay. Um, who do we have here? Do we have Tom Taylor's or who's? Oh, disclosures. Jerry Hill, can we uh, take disclosures? Uh, well, since you asked politely, okay. Um, uh, let's see. I'm just going to go by my screen. Dennis. Oh, uh, the last time I was up, I talked to him, so I haven't I haven't talked to these guys since. Okay, John. None. Yeah. Mark. Uh, yes, I met uh, Tom Torres at the site last weekend. Uh, went over the project. Okay, Jeff. Uh, Richard Fisher, why didn't, did you learn anything um, during your meeting that's not in the staff report? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, uh, just one quick note. I just wanted to say that uh, as a sort of a general note, four of us have a head start on Commissioner Wet Wetton. Um, we've heard this before, and that's true of a couple things tonight. So I would just wanted to say let's be mindful to allow him the scope in his questioning. And Commissioner Wetton, if, if uh, you know, there are no stupid questions, right? So um <laughs> make sure you've got the space you need in the whole discussion here gotcha. okay um with that let's go to the uh applicant patricia who do we have Chair, Chair Hill, did you did you say if you had just if you had any disclosures i have none okay uh the applicant team was available just for questions uh, Tom Torres is available, the owner, Richard Holmes, and their two geotechnical consultants. Okay. So they're only available for questions. Okay. That's nice and efficient. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, all right. So uh, how about public comment? Do we have any speakers out there? There are no public speakers signed up. I will look for raised hands. One moment, please. Thank you. There are no raised hands in the Zoom meeting. Okay, with that, then let's close the public testimony portion of the hearing and bring it back to the table uh, for deliberation. Who would like to open the discussion here? I'll start out partly. I mean, I've got two pages of notes, so I don't want to throw you all off. But... Um, uh, Let's do one. Uh, well, let me just ask again. How can the staff change the definition of the Coastal Commission without going to the Coastal Commission and changing that definition? Is this in regards to the bluff? Yes. So that slope, and correct me if I'm wrong, the applicant perhaps may be a good one, or uh, Adrian, too, if you've got the larger scale plans. But that slope is a four to one to three to one slope. Correct. Our code does not, you know, site of development is three to one. And then we you can apply a discretionary review to go two and a half to one to three to one. So essentially three to one is seen as flat. And so I, that is what Adrian was mentioning about the section. So 
when we talk about steep slopes, we're looking at something or we, in general, citywide LCP defines steep slopes as something that's steeper than two and a half to one. And the, the slope that is between that step and the building pad does not trigger any discretionary requirements. Per the code, uh, you know, if, if they could meet a setback there, that's a valid site of development. It, it falls within the LCP approved area of three to one and flatter. Okay, have we determined, have we determined the, the, uh, the stability factor of that site on that site? Since we have one-to-one -one slopes on the cliff? So what we have available this evening is I have our geotechnical reviewers because uh, where we left this last time was a question of whether or not the bluff retreat, um, perhaps Ali can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the last half of section 10.4D where the question was, was an analysis completed of bluff retreat? And did somebody look at erosion factors and, and that somebody being someone with a, a technical expertise, a geotech, and our geotechs uh, did meet with staff Yolanda arranged that, our building official, and there was a review done, and I have them here this evening uh, to be able to demonstrate to you what that re review was, uh, and also for the commission's ability uh, to, to ask questions of our geotechs. Well, let, let me interject there that I, I looked at that in the time series of the aerial photos on that, and I found that pretty persuasive, that um, that particular the geology of that particular bluff is pretty resilient and rocky. And, I, and it just is pretty clear that over the whole time that little, if any of that has eroded. So to me, the, the erosion rate here, you know, if we're counting votes now, I, I, don't, I don't find that to be a significant issue. I am, I am a little bit hung up still on this bluff question. And in my mind, not that we can redesign anything, but my, my sense would be, you might want to push the southeast portion of the house, not the whole thing, but the portion that comes closest to that corner. You might want to set that back 10 feet. And then um, I, I'd, you know, I'd be more comfortable about that bluff riser question there. But um, let's, let's leave that hanging for the moment. Well, my question there is, in 100 years, 100 years, our... We have certified it's not going to move at all. It's not going to erode at all. Well, we're, 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 why are we putting up uh, uh, retaining walls to hold it up if it's not going to move at all? Not one square and not one inch. Now, if you paint a house 100 years from now, the paint's not going to be on it. Okay, that's pretty solid structure. Zero, zero erosion. How can that be? Are you, I'm going to ask the, uh, uh, the expert. How can you have zero erosion in 100 years? It rains. Well, part of the, part of the deal is that you, you get at least the 50-foot setback. I mean, no, that... no, no. They said 10 feet for erosion, okay? I mean, how can you certify that there's zero erosion? Zero. Not one foot, not an inch. Not five inches, none. That's a question we asked. All they did is, as far as I'm concerned, write us back to zero. I don't think they did any studies. I'd like to hear what studies they did. Richard, this is Lauren. Um, in terms of our consulting team, um, Mike Phipps um, and Ali are here, as well as Chris Dean, the reviewer. Um, Mike has commentary on the bluff um, that might address the comments uh, Commissioner Hill um, was in, in the comments that he just made. And then Ali can address um, the slope stability, which includes Commissioner Mazna surficial stability, which does address erosion. And I don't think anybody is saying that there is zero erosion. So with that said, maybe we'll let Mike make an introductory comment and then about the bluff and then 
uh, unless Commissioner Hill doesn't want to hear about that. And then we can segue over to the slope stability and, and the, the slope position. H yeah. How does that sound? Yeah, let's do that and, and just try to be as concise as possible. Yes, we, we did actually, I will tell you that that we did, Commissioner Mazna, Maza, I know you, this may not have been in the report, but we did um, do an extensive re-review in, in answer to um, questions um, that were posed to us by the planning department. And we wrote two memos, uh, one about uh, 6,400 merit and one about bird view, addressing the questions. And with that, I'll stop and let Mike comment. Go ahead, Mike. Good evening. Um, I took a I took a long look at this, um, reviewed aerial photos going from 1928 all the way through the present, and um, I believe that this bluff would be what I would call a relic coastal bluff. The ocean hasn't been near it for quite a long time, uh, hundreds if not thousands of years. Um, the Pacific Ocean's 500 feet away from this bluff right now. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, there is some sufficient deposit accumulated at the base of the bluff, what we call talus. And so uh, the more the more talus you get, the, the more stable the, the natural bluff uh, configuration becomes. So um, we did not require anybody to address um, uh, you know, retreat of the bluff due to, uh, or accelerated retreat of the bluff due to sea level rise because the ocean's too far away and this bluff is at uh, elevation, the toe of the bluff is at elevation 25. And so we, um, you know, we determined that there would be no, there's not going to be, you can't have accelerated bluff retreat um, when there's no wave action at the toe of the bluff eroding the toe. So um, that was not required to be done uh, as part of the project consultant's analysis. And there's a question on that. Yes. Uh, we've always claimed in the past, or, or applicants have claimed, that, gee, no waves hit it, so therefore it can't erode. Every single landslide I've seen on bluffs starts at the top, not the bottom. Okay, waves don't hit the top of a 90 foot bluff. So there is erosion from the top. There is landslides from top of bluffs. Just, and the, the Coastal Commission determined in the case of Norm Haney where there was a road between him and the ocean. It doesn't matter if there's a road. Okay, that's, that's decided. Coastal Commission has decided. Now, are you subsurface designs? Is that who you are? No, I'm I'm one of your geotechnical reviewers. Okay, because they say that on on their letter dated October 22nd, which is not too long ago, they say that slopes ascending from PCH are 70 to 80 feet to the top of bluff, ranging from one and a half to uh, one half to one to one to one. Slopes continuing further on the bluff pad an additional 15 to 20 feet higher from two and a half to one to three to one. This section of the slope has been modified during grading and construction for several retaining walls and access stairs. Now, do you count what was originally there when you want to analyze or do you count what's been graded away? And why would a retaining wall be needed? I believe that would be a question for the design consultants uh, to answer and not the reviewers. If well, no, you're the asking about the technical analysis and why I, they did it the way they did. I, but I would assume that if you're reviewing coastal projects, you understand that it is prior to development, not after. You can't go up to a slope and say, oh, gee, I'll shave off 20 feet of it and make it three to one instead of uh, four to uh, five to one, or I mean, one to one. And then I'll come back later and say, oh, gee, that's the top of slope. 
That's not the way it works. So did you look at what the original top of slope was? Can I chime in? This is Chris. Chris Dean. Yeah. yeah, Chris, please, please go ahead. Is there evidence of um, what exactly was graded when? Uh, I haven't looked at the historic photo analysis to, to chime in on that directly, but I'm looking at uh, subsurface designs cross sections, and yeah, there has been some grading of the slope, has altered the top of the slope over the years, and they have built some stepped, I think they're wood retaining walls, probably to help stabilize that upper 10 feet or so of slope right below the existing development possibly for landscaping reasons that are, as well. But, you know, for slope stability analysis, we don't reconstruct what the slope looked like, nor do consultants and do an analysis on that because that's not the condition today. Well, uh, Ali may want to chime in on, on what we're looking at also. Can but, I, you know, the analysis are done on the slope today, and they do run static slope stability analysis, which is the gross stability of the slope, uh, surficial analysis, which were shown to be meet the current factors of safety, minimal requirements, and of course, a seismic stability as well. So uh, with that, maybe Ali can talk a little bit more about the slope stability analysis. Yes, uh, thank you, Chris. Hang on, let me just interject. Trevor, sure. Trevor, do we... There's this question of which slope do we look at, the original slope, the pre-graded slope, or the graded slope? Which one would should we be looking at here? We're talking about... Uh, I, I, I think uh, what we do, we just look at it as it is right now and after construction, how it is, and that's the basis for our evaluation of the stability of the slope. So the consultant presented calculations for the stability of the slope after the completion of the construction and grading and verified that he has required factors, factors of safety. And with regard to the question about the zero erosion, if this slope is not considered as an active bluff, it's considered as a normal slope, and the requirements for normal slope is to perform a rotational gross slope stability analysis for static and pseudo-static loading condition, which is seismic, and for surficial stability. Granted, there will be probably some minimal erosion from environmental factors, but in those situations, it's standard of practice to consider them to be insignificant to the point that they don't come into play in the design of the slope. It's unlike active bluff, where the rate of retreat can be a factor. Here you're talking about probably, if any, a few inches, and that's not something that is considered in the design of uh, ordinary slope, like we read this one, since it's not an active bluff. As, as I look at this, I see evidence of stability. I see those numbers. that Those look good. I see that the retreat rate does not look terribly substantial, that this is a relatively slowly eroding bluff compared to others that we deal with in town. So to me, a, a lot of it has to do with the definition of what is the actual top of the, the bluff. And I see a really clear dis difference between what you guys have used in referring to the precipitous part of it versus the LIP language that talks to, about the uh, using the topmost riser part of it. And that so th when and how much it was graded becomes relevant to that definition. It's, it's not necessarily relevant to your discussion of is it stable or not. But it is relevant to what what do you measure as the top of the bluff? Um, and I guess if it were if it had had been substantially graded, it could well be that the very top riser was the only riser at some point, right? Does anybody is is there any historical perspective on what that grading actually accomplished? Is that that whole lower terrace has been graded away? Is that or is, is some part of that a natural landform? Any of the geotechnical people, Mark? Mark, are you on? on yeah, I was going to say Mark Tribold should answer yeah. that. He's the Mark property Tribold geologist. Yeah, if, yeah. If he's here, that would be great to hear from him. Mark, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Did you hear my question? Did it make sense? It does. And from my review of the aerial photographs that go back to 28, it's it's my opinion that 
the, the area that these retaining walls have been constructed was somewhat rounded. It wasn't a steep precipitous slope that extended or was an extension of where we currently have the top of bluff. And so it's more of a rounded um, portion of the slope, which would, which to me puts the top of bluff right where we have it. It, it, it. There's no need, in my opinion, to be moving it further up based on my review of the photos. Okay. I want to take a straw poll on this right now. I want to ask a, a final question here. Okay. It's important. Number one, was the grading permitted ever? Were the retaining walls permitted ever? Number two, you stated that, oh, we'll, we'll figure out if it's stable after we put in the, the, uh, uh, the building. Well, no, we're supposed to do it before. So uh, when I read the surface designs analysis, they say on page 19 that friction piles are re going to be required, required because of uh, underlying terrace deposits. Required. So they're saying you got to do it. It's not stable. Friction piles don't necessarily saying? have anything to do with stability, um, but yeah. but the consultant should answer why the friction piles are being requested. And I don't believe that uh, uh, Ali Abdul Haq's commentary was um, that you don't figure out you, you figure out the stability after the house. W what the design requirement is you're looking at what you're proposing and the configuration that you're proposing is the one that needs to be analyzed. That's the one that needs to be analyzed. Yeah, but but my, my basic question is, can you take a slope that has been determined by these subservice design guys to be non, not stable and not to have friction piles to bedrock and round it off and say, well, that's where the top isn't anymore without any permits or any history on it. And you're talking about a slope that they describe in here as, as having uh, unstable subsurface uh, layers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then to just blithely say there's no erosion and there's where the top is um, seems very strange to me, especially when it's, it's, defined by the Coastal Commission, defined as Craig Red. John, okay. That's our LIP. John, to your question about when and were there any permits, when you look at the aerial photos, that shelf or step or whatever we're calling it was graded, was graded a long time ago. That's that's in the aerial photos the whole way through. So uh, saying that, that that step thing was there in 1928. Uh, it, it may be, it may have been. If it was in the first photo that I saw, if the first photo was 1928, certainly, certainly as early as the 1950s. Um, Tom, Tom Torres has his hand up here. Let's let's see if you, Tom, can we bring you in just on this specific question about the the bluff edge? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Good evening, okay. everyone. A couple of things. One is. Uh, those walls that are, we're discussing have been there since 1956. If you look at all the aerial photographs that go back to the beginning of time of which I provided those and made those available to the planners, I do not have them able to load now to put them before you, unfortunately. But We, we saw those. We, we saw those. You saw that the, those walls have been there since the house was built in 1956. If you look down... If you projected what the slope would be from what we're calling the, by definition, the bluff edge. Bluff edge, by definition in the LIP, is defined as the upper termination of the bluff, cliff or sea cliff. We've determined where the top of the bluff is through the work of, of Trebo's uh, firm, subsurface, and I think was collaborated and, and uh, substantiated by the uh, geotechnical city staff. But more importantly, from that plane, if you projected that to the top of the plane, just put a, a line in to determine the gradient, it's about a three, three and a half to one slope. It's really slope. It's irregardless of what they did in 56 to create an area, maybe they played bocce ball. The area that is flat below that is about 40 feet wide. So 
Consequently, if you project a line from there to the top of the slope, the slope is minimal. So they were not grading a cliff by any stretch of the imagination. And those walls have performed well. And they're very, there's about a six foot differential between the two pad areas that we're talking about. That six foot area is, was landscaped. If you go there, those of you that went there, the planners went there and saw what was there. The commissioner went to the site, saw what was there. And you can see that there's still from when our, our current client owns the property that we designed it from. You can see there's a couple of chairs, there was a table. So obviously the people in 56 used it for whatever purpose they used it for, but they did not grade a steep slope. So there was no permits to our knowledge. We, we did a, made a big effort to backtrack on everything we could find on this property. We went to historical aerials to determine anything we could find out about the rains dealing with El Nino, going back to the 80s and 90 storms. We found photographs from the 60s that showed no, no, and granted this is two dimensional. We didn't do the three dimensional study that Mark Trebo did in, on the slope, but the two dimensional does not show any bluff retreat at all. And it shows that flat area intact all the way back to the, from our photographs from 1956 and 59. Okay, okay. I have a question to Christine on this. Uh, Chris, if I look at your geotechnical review dated uh, April 20th, you deny this project on a geotechnical basis. And by the way, there is no final approval by you in the file. Zero. Okay, that's the last geotechnical we, we got it. And you denied it because they, the consultant set an approved geotechnical report for the development of adjacent single family residence at 29917 PCH, aka 6406 Merritt Drive. The consultant needs to provide complete citation of the reference property based on a review of on-base files. There, there was a geotechnical letter for the adjacent property dated 2007 with comments regarding uh, a long bedding strength of 250 PSI, whatever that means. Uh, the geotechnical review was, reviewer was unable to locate the response to the review letter and subsequent approvals of the long bedding strength, blah, blah, blah. Please provide documentation. Number one, did you get that? And number two, did you ever sign a geotechnical review sheet approving this project? And when was it dated? Uh, yes, Commissioner Massa, this is Chris responding. Um, looking at the files, um, Mark Trebold and Subsurface Design submitted a response to our uh, July, or April 20th uh, review letter dated April 27th. Uh, Ali and I approved it and provided an approval a coastal development permit recommendation for approval letter dated July 24th, 2020. So that, that was reviewed and uh, all conditions were met that, that we had in that earlier review letter. Thanks. Okay, and then I have one more question of you. Uh, on February, January 14th this year, subservice design letter, the last one I think they have, uh, saying, the proposed single family residence and swimming pool on the western side of the development shall be supported by pile foundations extending into the underlying terrace deposits and bedrock. The proposed piles shall derive support from underlying terrace deposits and extend into be uh, bedrock a minimum of five feet. Um, blah, blah, blah. And then it says the existing uncertified fill and natural soil encountered at the depth of six feet in exploration places the site shall be removed and recompacted and supported to support the, the house in swimming pool. I can find nowhere in, in any of the requirements any of that being required. Uh, now, if they say it's, it's uncompacted fill, uh, how can it be certified as being stable? 
Uh, I, Six I, feet I, of a compacted fill, plus yeah, a one I, I think that was an addendum report by, by Subsurf and Mark, maybe you can chime in also. They were just providing additional recommendations to provide adequate support for the uh, uh, pertinent structures for the development and also recommendations for that second pool to be put on power foundations uh, as per their recommendations. And, you know, that's to us. And, that and one more thing, uh, Chris, uh, uh, I think this uncertified field is not going to be used for foundation support. No, that's, that's what I'm saying. They're, they're going to remove and recompact the uncertified field to create a stable substrate to put their foundations in for the new pertinent structures. They were just giving us additional recommendations to mitigate the uncertified condition out there. And then you decided to not take their advice and not require friction piles into, into bedrock because it's, it's not a stable hill. That was their, that was their, their recommendation, subsurface recommendations. And we concur with their recommendations of being very conservative out there to put deep in foundations out there. But I would like to clarify something, Commissioner Mosna, because I think there's a little bit of confusion and I just want to clarify it um, because you can have a stable slope, right? But you may have soils on the site that are not suitable for support of the foundation, but those soils aren't necessarily related to stability of the site. Geotechnical engineers and consultants use those terms in two different ways, and it all depends on the context that you're talking about. So the slopes calculated stable for seismic, static, and for surficial. Now, yeah. there may be unsuitable soils that they want to stabilize, or if they're not going to stabilize them, they'll support the foundations through them into stable soils. But Stable but, soils. I, I don't want to mix up stable soils with slope stability. Well, I understand I that. that's happening. I understand that, but I can see nowhere in the plans or the requirements they do that. Right, but that's normally when we handle that. This is planning approval. We're not in building plan check yet. That's when all those recommendations that the geotechnical consultants make that's when all their recommendations get put onto the plans, onto the final engineering plans. And then we go through when we start parsing all their recommendations versus what they're showing on the plans. And if we have any additional questions about engineering or, or anything like that, that's when they get asked. They get asked in building plan check, not in planning. Planning is feasibility, right? Well, planning also includes uh what they have to certify is that we follow the LCP. And I don't, I don't particularly see removal and recompaction of that whole bluff face uh, that you don't call a bluff as in our grading plans uh, or our grading approvals. John, grading, let's, let's, yeah, let's, those come in building plan check. No, they don't. They come in our, uh, and they come in our certified table. What does this comply with LIP? No more than a thousand cubic yards. And we have a table for that. Right, right. I understand. And we that. have to approve that table. We have to believe in it. Not, not some planner, uh, some plan checker uh, six months from now. John, let's, 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 you've made your case here. Let's leave this point here and move on to any other issues. And it's on the record now. If, you know, and if we come back to it, it may be part of the pre preponderance of if there's a denial or or it may not. But let's I think I think the point is pretty clear at this point about the geology. Commissioner Jennings. Right. I have a kind of a compound question to ask, and it's directed to city geotechnical staff, whether in-house or uh, consultants. And I'm looking at the retreat calculation that needs to be made and I'm sort of walking through. LIP uh, section 10.4 D. Um, this is the whole question about whether the uh, minimum setback from the bluff can be reduced from 100 to 50. And um, it's interesting language because um, it's again, I have to just, this is an aside. I, I sometimes laugh at the way this Coastal Commission drafted this thing. In no case shall development be set back less than 100 feet. Yeah. Well, except. Yeah. So this system may be reduced to 50, uh, 50 feet if the city geotechnical staff determines that either of the conditions below can be met with a lesser setback. And then you go to 
the two alternatives. One is that the uh, factor of safety is less than 1.5, and the other is that the factor of safety is greater than 1.5. And um, so I take it that at some point, uh, city geotechnical staff was determined that, uh, was convinced that the uh, factor of safety was greater than 1.5, taking into account all of the nine criteria that are listed uh, further on in that section. Is that is that correct, geotechnical staff? Yeah, who, who do you want to ask? Is that for Chris or Lauren? Uh, Lauren, if you're ready to answer it, or Chris, either one. Well, it actually really should be the two reviewers. That should be Chris Dean and Ali Abdel Haq, who reviewed this specific project. Okay. So, Chris, Chris, is that is that the case? Do you hear my question? I did hear your question. Yes, and we did uh, review this project in accordance. Um, Watch your Chris. Oops. Two as this project was not a shoreline and bluff development project uh, based on what we said before about being it's so far away from active erosion on a beach. So they met all the requirements for static, pseudostatic, or seismic and superficial stability, you know, indicating the top of the, of the slope. And for that, they were able to set back accordingly to meet all those requirements. Let me, let me, let me, Put the question in a different way. Okay. Um, the the initial the, the entryway into this into this inquiry is whether or not geotechnical staff is determines that either we're talking about a bluff top project whether the bluff exhibits a factor of safety of less than one point five or whether it exhibits a gross and superficial factor of safety. Uh, greater than 1.5. At some point, city staff had to be determined, had to make a determination on that based upon whatever the applicant was submitting to. Did you make that determination that the bluff in this case exhibits a gross and superficial factor of safety greater than 1.5? That's kind of a yes, yes or no. Yes. Huh? yes. Okay, fine. Now, then what it says is that you then have to make a determination of the likely um, erosion that's going to take place over the next hundred years. And this has to be done by a, a, a state licensed certified engineer geologist or registered civil engineer or geotechnical engineer. And it has to be based on a site specific evaluation of the long-term bluff retreat at the site and include all an allowance for possible acceleration of historic bluff retreat rates due to sea level rise. And you've already told us that that doesn't apply here because it's unlikely. Uh, and, the, and the LIP also requires that uh, in making this long-term bluff retreat rate, you have to use an historic average that accounts for both periods of exceptionally high bluff retreat, such as extreme storm events and long periods of relative little or no bluff retreat, uh, so on. So the question then becomes, uh, did you make the, the, the city staff determine that a bluff retreat, um, what the bluff retreat uh, over 100 years was likely to be? We don't determine that. The, the consultant does. So Mark Trebold can comment on that. But what they presented, um, we reviewed and accepted. So, um, and that the, the position of the setback exceeds the likely retreat rate over 100 years plus 10, plus 10 feet, correct? Correct. Or, okay. Yes, uh, Ali can answer that, yeah. but, but, but yes. Okay, Let, let's okay. leave that there. Let's, John Maza, you had a question? Yeah, number one, uh, what is that number? Okay. If they determined it, what was the number? The hundred the year, the, hundred yeah, year hundred erosion rate. Yeah, and this, all the staff report says is, oh, you know, it's okay. Yeah, Chris, do we have okay. a number for that? 
because it's a requirement to determine that. Did somebody actually sit down with a piece of paper and write it down? Chris, do you have that number in front of you or Mark? I, Mark Trebold? I do not can you... have that number in front of me, no. M Mark, Mark do, you... do you have that number in front of you? 100 year erosion. Um, as I had written up in my letter, dated uh, the October 29th letter, I presented it. I, my opinion was that the amount of bluff erosion would be negligible. Okay, but negligible is not a determination, it's an opinion. Did somebody actually calculate it, which is required by the LIP? Number two, did somebody actually do a uh, slope stability analysis by on this particular property, or they just said it's okay? Did they follow all the requirements of Coastal Commission on determining slope stability? I just asked that oh, the yeah. answer was yes. Yeah. Yes. Especially we, we, have the drilling holes and all that stuff. They yes, ran that's... they ran static slope stability and came up with factor safety greater than 1.5. They came up with seismic factors of safety over 1.0 and superficial factors of safety greater than 1.5. But did they ever determine the actual number? Yes, yes the number is, is yeah, greater yeah. than one and a half. Yeah. The, the, number, the numbers for static were between 1.68 and 1.73. Uh, seismic between 1.01 .01 and 1.09, and sufficient factor safety was 1.62. Okay, now my last question to Chris is, you stated just now that this is not a coastal bluff, okay? And the Coastal Commission on four different losses by the city, the Coastal Commission said, oh, yes, it is. It, it can be as much as two miles inland and still be a coastal bluff. Their definition of a coastal bluff is different than yours. It's a bluff facing the ocean. Okay. Yeah, John, this is irrelevant. But, yeah, I don't know. The, 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 the provisions talk about a bluff top. It doesn't matter whether it's a coastal bluff or any other kind of a bluff. Yeah. The rules apply. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to pause the geology here and look at the rest of everything. We can come back to this, but... Um, just to get a general sense of anything else that's going on on the on the application, do do people have other concerns? We'll get back to this one. Um, I'm seeing I'm seeing sort of blank looks from everybody, so everybody's feeling. I have, kind no, of other, okay. I have no other concerns. Okay, I I have a, a couple concerns that uh, just to put out there. This is a little bit, uh, yeah, Jenna Smith, yes. Mine's only a moment here. Uh, yeah. Commissioner Maza, you've got, you're asking a double-sided question, and you got a double answer. You've got our coastal engineer, Michael Phipps. He gave you the answer about the erosion and how, mo and how it won't really ever erode, other than what it is. You've got Mr. Trebold, who had to do his report, and gave you those answers. You've got some of the best that we've got right here in front of you on this screen at about $1,000 an hour sitting here telling you. And, well, and I can hire somebody for $1,000 an hour telling me the moon is made out of blue cheese. Okay, let's, 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 not, let's, not, talk of, they, they, let's not talk about Anybody that says nothing erodes in 100 years is incompetent. He said oh, negligible, but let, let's let's move on. Thing to say. That's true. That's a, that's I'm, I'm banging my gavel here. I'm banging my gavel. Uh, which, by the way, where is my gavel? I mean, come on. Um, okay, I want to move on to a couple other issues. We'll, we'll come back to this. This will feed into how we how we go on the vote. But um, and this may seem like a little bit out of left field, but. CEQA exemption. We have multiple dwelling structures here, but this is going to be a question for staff. Um, and you get the exemption for multiple units. Um, well, it, you, you get a, an exemption for one single family residence or a second dwelling unit with an exception that says in urbanized areas up to three units. So if this is we're an urbanized area, then we're fine. My question then, though, is the general plan describes Malibu Park as expressly rural and talks about the the rural character of the Malibu Park neighborhood. So, uh, you know, I think we just kind of skipped past CEQA, but 
Can staff offer, offer an argument as to why the general plan designation of rural should be ignored in that provision so that we can treat this as an urbanized exemption to CEQA? I can probably speak to that, uh, Richard. Um, the CEQA um, guidelines actually has a definition for what is an urbanized area. In that definition, it points to as uh, identified by the census and, um, and specifically the census map. And uh, we downloaded the census map for the city of Malibu uh, and it identifies the areas that are primarily developed as urbanized, uh, not to say that the city's uh, general plan is wrong, is just that it's a different definition for the general plan than it is for CEQA. So it, there were like two different English languages, I guess is what you're saying. Well, um, you, you can't apply the definition in the general plan or CEQA guidelines because they have their own definition. The, the, okay. You can imagine the, uh, the chaos you could create if you could just change that yourself by what you put in your general plan. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just, you know, raising it because it's it's... It's black black words on the page there that seem to conflict, so I thought I'd call it out. But in, in the past, just to be clear, I think, uh, because this might come up in other projects, we have uh, uh, determined that accessory structures such as ADUs and, you know, swimming pools and things like that, uh, when part of a single family residence, they are, you know, in one, one development and have been exempt under that same exemption. We'll argue about that someday, but let's move on to a, a, a different, um, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, just reading CEQA there, but another question I have is about, um, are, are we pre presenting the, the minimum environmental impact when we have essentially three pools on this, th two swimming pools and the pond? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it just I, in terms of precedent and what people are getting in places, this this just gives me a little bit of a you know. It just raises a question. What, well, how how did staff look at this? I don't know if you want to answer that, Richard. Um, from a planning perspective, uh, I think we just look at it and make sure it complies with all the code requirements. Uh, setbacks. Um, they have a. <laughs> uh, because they're not um, affecting ESHA, they have a development area um, that is not allowed to extend beyond two acres. Um, the property itself is 2.7 acres. So uh, they're, you know, per the code, they're allowed to sort of spread out their development in, in the way that they're proposing. Now, again, uh, questions have come up about the bluff setback and you know, um, you know, uh, there could be questions uh, made uh, here about, you know, whether the second or third swimming pool uh, should be that close to the top of bluff. And I think that's something that the commission can, um, you know, decide on. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, just getting these things on the record. And then I guess my last uh, question, apart from the geology, which still is hanging out there is, um, the third year, the, the detached studio is practically a third unit. It has the bathroom. It has it has a nice space for the kitchen in a way that the the plumbing could be easily configured right through the wall to have a sink on the other side and make a kitchen. Is there some condition we put in that just that says that expressly cannot be made into a third unit in the future, or do we do we have concerns about that? Uh, we don't typically condition projects uh, to, you know, uh, make oh, sure okay. they don't later become code uh, enforcement. They're, the code is, is you know, kind of stands on its own. Uh, and if they were to convert that illegally, uh, that's a code violation that we can go after them. Yeah, now, okay. in, in, in the past, when you have a space that's sort of, intertwined, um, you know, one one building 
that has a studio with a accessory, you know, an exterior access and then an ADU and a garage and things like that for those structures, because those are very easy as well to modify so that it becomes one large, you know, uh, guest house or, or, or ADU. Um, we have in some cases, um, add, uh, we have added a condition to deed restrict. Um, but again, that's, really up to the planning commission, whether they want to do that for this project. Okay. Can, can we, I, I think I'm ready to go back to the geology and, and approach maybe a vote on this. Can I get the uh, plan view up on the screen? Something that shows the whole site with the, the, the house on it. Alex, are you there? I don't know what your presentation is in front of you where it's easy to just pick out the right slide. But let's look at this from the top. Alex, are you there? I'm not hearing anybody. S slide seven, Alex, if you can bring that up. Um, that's the one with all the buildings. There you go. Well, that's that's a pretty one. Okay. So my my question and my concern about the the bluff edge and the definition. When, okay, it's hard to talk about what's north and what's east and west because it's on such an angle, but on, on the top side of this image, um, the slope seems pretty clear to me that it would be easy to describe it the way the tech, geotech people have been calling that one slope. On the bottom edge of the build of, the, of this view, it all merges together there. It, it really looks more like one steep slope that comes all the way up close to the building. Now, when I look at the building, I see it as sort of two overall masses. And my wonder and my thought is whether we could ask to say that the part that the lower half of the building here is the one that is closest to the slope. Could we kind of reshift the design or sort of condition it in some way that says, that that lower part needs to be, you know, whatever it is, 10, 15 feet further back from the bluff edge, that the, that the top part, the top half is okay where it is, the pool is okay where it is, but the, the issue is around the corner where that lower half approaches so closely to the bluff. Could we somehow condition that to say, you know, adjust the design so that gets slid away from the bush by, by some proportion? I mean, we're not here to, to redesign the house, but Trevor, you have a jump on in. Sure. The, the, well, the, I see Commissioner Smith too. Uh, I'll just briefly say um, the option for the uh, the commission, if if if, it, if that edge, if you could not make the findings required because of the way it's located, is to um, offer the applicant the opportunity to des redesign it to bring it back. Because I think the planning planning staff would need to see exactly what they want to do. It's not something that's just administrative they could do. Mm -hmm. So it would be they would bring back a plan, they would move it back. Um, or otherwise, if they just want to um, accept the vote or potential denial on the project, they could do that if they want to make, keep it in the same spot. Dennis, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that I, there's no reason to condition it. The house has already been moved back from the original position. And trust me, the structural engineers have designed this thing to sit right where it sits. There's no reason to move it or turn it or do any of that. The, uh, Mr. Torres has taken advantage of, of the view uh, looking a certain way with the, with the homeowner, and that's what you, that's why, why it's sitting that way. And between geological setbacks, and they fit the house right where it can set, and they moved it back and gave it more stability, if you will, than than before. Along with having yeah. to do the okay. over X and taking out the bad dirt underneath it and all that, they're going to fix all that. That house is perfect right where it sets. Okay, John. Uh, this is an Adrian question, I guess. Is there any code require, requirement that would preclude them from moving this house back 10 feet? Which is obviously there's 10 feet there to move it. Uh, is there any? Move it, move it away from the slope 10 feet? Yes. I mean, there's no code requirement that would prevent them from doing that. I, I do want to point one thing is that um, the contours are a bit deceiving um, and the you know, the distance between the very steep area versus the rest of it, uh, it does look like one continuous slope, but there is a, you know, a big difference 
in the steepness. We do have the cross sections that were provided in the geotechnical report that actually has a cross section right through that slope. Um, if you wanna review that, um, I forward that to Alex for him to show it um, if you wanna see it. Yeah, that might be helpful. I mean, honestly, it's just that one corner. I, I live in a, on a house on an old site, 75 years old with almost no setback. And I, I know what it is to deal with the slope and, and my, my uh, topo map probably looks very similar to what's going on in the lower left corner of this house. Except this one will be stabilized through a grading process. That's the huge difference. That's yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a difference. Well, we're saying it doesn't need stabilization. Let, 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 let me hear. Tom Torres has his hand up. While we're waiting for Alex to pull out that uh, section view, Tom, what's your comment on this? Can we open Tom's mic, Tom Torres? Can I do that? Maybe I can do that. Yeah. He doesn't seem to be unmuted. Am I okay? Yeah, there you I are. I just want to speak to your, your question or your concern about the topography. I think Adrian spoke to the point. If you look at the gradients that you're speaking about, they're all like three to one. You know, normally if we wouldn't having all these other questions about where the top of the bluff is and if we set back from the top, et cetera, where the bluff edge actually exists, we would we we theoretically could be building in that area further forward because the slope gradients in that area are within the municipal code definition of what we could build on. Now, if if and I think this this clearly shows it. I can I can appreciate your your statement, particularly particularly when you walk around the house where it currently exists, the fifty six house, nineteen fifty six. It's very close at that corner. That's not what we're doing. I think you're forgetting to, that we're moving the house back 25 to 30 feet, the house, not the pool, but the house back from the top. So we have a yard in front of the house. So we're not edgy, we're not anywhere near where the old existing house is. But more importantly, if we were, the gradient would allow us to build there. Okay. Um, I don't, okay, let me, I'm not seeing other hands. Uh... John, uh, Jeff, Jeff. Yeah, um, I found uh, finally um, the uh, Mr. Trebolt's letter of October 29, and I'm satisfied uh, on the point that I raised earlier. So I'm going to make a motion uh, that we approve staff recommendation. Second it. John, I make an amendment uh, on the on the next item. We have a what I consider an important uh, part of the conditions in that uh, we're conditioning certain items to have, if there's three violations in, by, on this, by the same property owner result in a requirement to immediately remove the violations. And this, these, I would like to propose, we add that language to uh, fencing, lighting provisions to make it, humongously easier for code compliance to do their jobs. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you're asking if there's a friendly amendment to add something uh, having to do with the uh, number of strikes before you're out. Right. And I want to add that, that, that fences, lighting, and landscaping, if they violated three times in a row, same owner, just the language is condition number 21 on the next item, uh, then then uh, compliance can enforce. Okay, so I'm not going to allow it as a friendly amendment, and here's the reason why. This We, we need to avoid coming up with this chaos, this, this, this jungle of specific provisions that we put in this place and put in that place. If we have standard provisions that we include in every project, that's one thing. But by pulling and choosing little elements to put into this one and little elements to put in that one, we end up with this completely bewildering and essentially unequal uh, application of the law to 
various people. So no, not as a, a friendly amendment. You can make it as a as a well, what I'm as doing amendment, is, if you will. I, I'd like to make an amendment because what I'm proposing is it is in everything. It's in the next one. Uh, it's, it's in other ones. Uh, we should put it in all of them. Well, so, wait, wait, wait. So the question is, why is it not in this one? Is there a reason it was left out? Somebody didn't put it in. And we do have chaos in we, compliance in this town. Chaos. We, we, we do have a condition regarding landscaping. And the condition is three violations requires that they remove the landscaping for good. I don't think you can apply that to exterior lighting or to or to fencing, because I think what you're saying is that, uh, you know, three violations. Well, you don't need to have three violations. The first violation would require code enforcement to act on a fence that's installed uh, outside of the code requirements. Same would apply with exterior lighting, and it would be addressed that way without having to wait for three consecutive violations. Well, they can do whatever they want before that, but this allows them to do it. Now we did do it in the next one, so somebody decided we can do it. Okay, let's let's go. Never, and, never. and, and uh, I, I was just going to say, Adrian, I think the reason you have that three strikes policy for landscaping is because it grows back, right? Correct. Um, if you do something that's in violation of you know the specific requirements of this permit, that's subject to. Um, you know, immediate, you know, fines or, you know, bring it back into compliance with landscaping. It's hard to keep on top of, you know, it's something that keeps growing back and they don't keep it at the right levels. That's why I think that's a standard condition that you add to most uh, landscaping projects that have the potential to exceed a, a height limit. Is that correct, Adrian? That's correct. Jeff. So, okay. Well, Adrian, excuse me, John. Jeff. Adrian is, um, is that landscaping condition included in, in um, this particular uh, resolution? Uh, let's verify. I would suspect is there. Okay, John, do you have any more there? Well, yeah. The, the point is, is we you can plug a light back in after you get busted for the dark skies ordinance. Okay, how many times do you need to go out there and tell him to unplug his light? We have it in item four, uh, whatever the next item is, four C. Well, okay. So the question for Richard or Adrian is, why do we have this in one application and not in the other? One's a fire rebuild. Well, called Mississippi development. Um, there, <laughs> neither are fire rebuilds. That'd go. No, no, I'm you're talking, talking about talking about bird view. Bird view. Talking about bird view. Oh, we don't care about bird view right now. Okay, but I'm saying you're telling me I can't do it, but we do it. But so the question is, why is it in one and not in the other? I, I, yeah, there's that. Um, landscaping condition is not in here, so we should certainly add that. Um, I am seeing, however, um, ironically, that the condition regarding uh, lighting is in here. Um, it says three violations of the conditions by the same property owner will result in a requirement to permanently remove the outdoor lighting fixture from the site. Okay. So the reason why I'm adding fences is, as you know, we have Moon Nursery in Malibu, and the biggest problem in compliance is people plant, bring in an eight-foot hedge. They tell them to cut it to six, and it's eight foot a year later. And they have to <laughs> tell them to cut it to six, and it's eight foot a year later, and they do it again. Okay. So you're talking about fences that grow? Yeah. Now, do we have anything at all in this landscape requirement? That says you can't have a tree that grows. Uh, isn't, isn't that landscaping? What? Isn't that landscaping, John? That that is landscaping. Oh, that is a fence. No. If it's on, it's in the side yard setback, and it's over six feet tall, tall, and it's a hedge. It's a fence. That's defined. And, and by the way, the the condition for lighting, I, I stand corrected. It it's because somebody can actually replace a light bulb to one that doesn't comply. So there is potential to, uh, you know, for that to change as well as the landscaping. Um, that is different from fencing and walls where, you know, they're, they're approved at a specific height. If they uh, increase in height, you know, that they just have to remove it. 
Well, I'm getting, trying to give yeah, okay. the compliance okay. officer a tool to make that permanent. Okay. I can name you a hundred houses on Point Doom that he has to go out and deal John, with. John, it's not necessary. If the fence has to be no more than six feet high, that will remain true even if they keep violating it. So it, it, they can take the fence out. They can stick it back again. They can do it again a second time and get fined more. Hopefully, no, but, no fines. You forget. Well, that. I, I think I think that it's covered by the. Okay, if we uh, want to spend a couple hundred thousand it, dollars a year for a couple more compliance officers to handle fences, fine. Well, it, that's it, that's it, that's the bigger issue, and that's what we should be doing, maybe. But I, I think we're I think we're getting close to a vote here. Are we it's, not? It's the question about fencing that uh, they could change the permeability or the open portion of it within the front yard setback? Is, is that the question, Commissioner? Well, no, it's it's all the way around. You can grow a... I can show you a house with 20-foot hedges, okay? I yeah, can but, show you a house... A hedge, a I can show you a house... A current compliance uh, uh, operation right now is a house we approved six months ago that had to have a 42-inch hedge uh, front yard setback. Two weeks after it was completed, they moved in eight feet, Okay. Okay, John, but this is a compliance issue and it's real, but it's not anything that we can put words on a page that's going to make it better. We just did. Okay, that's what I'm saying. We just did. Well, uh, uh, we're, everything we need is in here already, though, right? Only for because... lighting. So, I think, Adrian, uh, was your, was your suggestion was to add the uh, landscaping condition from the, is that correct? That is my yeah. recommendation, yeah. Is, yeah uh, can you read yeah, that we, condition? Because that would apply to the hedge, right? Yes, we we missed that condition, and that should be part of the resolution. So we could perhaps add something to condition 55, because condition 55 in this resolution is what addresses the hedges, and it calls out specifically the heights. That would save you guys, save our staff a lot of time. Okay, and since we've been talking about landscaping, that reminded me. On the on the landscape plan, they've got 12 foot Prunus Caroliniana on the property line by the pool, and I did talk to Tom about this when I first was on the site, and, and he said, "Yeah, he'd put in something um, lower. That's that stuff will grow pretty tall. You don't you don't need anything to go more than six feet. You can't have anything that goes more than six feet. Well, uh, well, you can have something that'll grow to seven or eight feet. You have to trim it though. So, but that that the Prunus Caroliniana will grow tw 12 feet easily. So, um, I, and he was amenable when we talked about that. He said, yeah, we'll put in something else, but you might want to just write in something that the landscape plan, uh, whatever's on that side by the pool needs to be a species that grows to a lower height than what they have listed. Okay, let me ask a question, please. Yes. Um, I see condition 28 which has three violations of the conditions by the same property owner will result in a requirement to permanently remove the outdoor light fixture from the site. I see 55, which basically just restates the, the development standard. It doesn't have anything to, sit, to do with three violations or three strikes or anything else. Um, what is it that you're proposing, Adrian? Uh, we do have a standard condition. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, write it in here. Um, and the standard condition says that uh, similar to the lighting requirement, but it's specifically the landscaping or for hedges specifically, that uh, if there are more, uh, if there are three violations, then um, they are required to remove that portion of their landscaping uh, from their property. Adrian, can you read to us the text? Yeah, let me, let me, can we read it into the record? Yeah, let me find it. Then Commissioner Jennings can decide if you want to add it as a friendly amendment. Well, Commissioner Jennings is a little concerned about how standard conditions don't end up in the standard <laughs> resolution. And I guess the broader question, while we're looking for that, do I have to read every every condition and every resolution to, to figure out what new policies planning staff is imposing. I mean, I don't remember 
there being a vote on the three violations uh, for uh, the lighting fixtures, uh, making that a, a, a removal situation. Did we vote on that? Was that a, an action that we took to make that yeah. a standard condition? Yeah, that was a vote made by the Planning Commission uh, for a few projects a few years back, and then we decided to implement that on all projects. And I just found the language. It's on that same condition 55. Um, it's just missing the very last sentence, uh, which is three violations of this condition will result in a requirement to permanently remove the vegetation from the site. Well, um, no, I, mean, I think that's a ridiculous condition, frankly. Uh, you just cut the thing back to the, to the, the normal height and uh, you know, people want to complain about it, they can complain about it. But so no, I won't agree to that as a as a change. Uh, I've got your staff recommendation, but it's staff recommendation that we have to I'd like to make, make a motion language. to include that language. Uh, all you have to do is drive around Point Doom, and you'll see why. That's a that's a motion to amend uh, Commissioner Jennings' motion to include the sentence just read by Adrian onto Condition Fifty Five in the resolution. Is that your motion? Correct. I'll, I'll second it for the sake of consistency. If we're putting this on other applications, let's, you know, put it, put it on all of them. Okay, then we need to take the vote on the motion, on the motion to amend. Okay, uh, okay I'm running the show. Can, can we have a uh, roll call on, on that vote, please? Yes. Commissioner Maza? Yes. Vice, Ch excuse me, Chair Hill? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? No. Vice Chair Smith? No. Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Wait. The amendment carries. Was that a yes, Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was a little garbled, but okay. And then now now we're are we on to the main motion now? There's no yes, further. So now, <laughs> now that the motion, which was staff's recommendation, has been amended to include the sentence read by Adrian onto condition 55. So the, the, the motion then is to approve st staff recommendation with uh, that sentence added onto condition 55. Okay, can we call the roll on that one then? Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Vice Chair Smith? Yes. Commissioner Maza? No. Commissioner Wetton? I'm sorry, can you repeat it? The, the motion is, is to is staff's recommendation, which is to approve the project, and but it includes uh, amending condition 55 to include the sentence Adrian read out about uh, three violations of condition 55 require the removal of the um, vegetation. Uh, yes. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, it being now 844, I think this would be a good time to take a 10 minute break if, if that's the pleasure of the body here, uh, before we get on to the next big one. So with that being said, why don't, well, why don't we call it, uh, 855. Um, everybody turn off your cameras and your audio and so forth, and we'll see you back in 10. Thanks.
Okay, let's see. We're we're still missing John. Um, somebody needs to turn on my video, I think. Can you do that yourself? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't open. There you go. There you go. Okay. We're back to the table. We're all here. Um, I have to say I was remiss in not calling out at the beginning that we are joined by Rebecca Evans, who is shadowing Patricia tonight. She'll be taking over to be, be doing the, uh, ministerial activity here. So um, uh, I just thought we should welcome her and, and presumably she'll be on board with us uh, running the show the next time. So hi, Rebecca, wherever you are in there. Um, okay. We're uh, I also, let me comment on that. Uh, Rebecca delivered the largest staff report I've ever gotten <laughs> on time and uh, reported back who she gave it to and everything else. And I think she's doing an outstanding job so far. Yeah, I'd agree. Well, welcome. Welcome. Not that Patricia didn't do a great job or Kathleen before. Well, Kathleen set a high bar. All right, let's, let's go on. We are now on uh, item. What is it? 4C coastal development permit 17-083 minor modification number 17-017 and demolition permit number 17-029, an application to demolish an existing single family residence and construct a new two story single family residence and associated development continued from November 15th, 2021 at 7247 Birdview Avenue within the appealable zone. Um, can we have a staff report on this please? Looks like DA already went to Beverly Hills and left. Yeah. yeah. Until the end of the week. <laughs> DA, remember this. This this will be a long lasting memory. Your last hearing here. <laughs> DDA did a runner. Is he is he in the room? Yes. Do you know? He is. It looks like he's having some audio problems. Okay. I can see him talking, but we can't hear him. Okay. Can we get my phone? I'm sorry. Hi, can you guys hear me now? No, yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened. They showed that I was unmuted. Anyhow. Uh, good evening, Chair Hill and members of the Planning Commission. The next item on the agenda is Coastal Development Permit Number 17-083, which includes minor modification number 17-017 and demolition permit number 17-29 for a project located at 7247 Birdview Avenue. This item was continued for the November 15, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Next slide, please. The subject property is located in the Point Doom neighborhood on the ocean side of Birdview Avenue, north of Westward Beach and Westward Beach Road in the rural residential one acre zoning district. Next slide, please. So, Coastal Development Permit number 17 83 is for the demolition of, any, of the existing single family residence and on site development. Uh, a new 6,691 square foot two story single family residence, not to exceed 18 feet in height, with an attached garage and a basement. A new swimming pool measuring 17 feet by 33 feet long. Uh, associated pool equipment to be fully screened, a driveway, motor cord and gates, new landscaping, grading, retaining walls, and installation of a new OWTS. It also includes minor modification 17017 for a 50% reduction of the required front yard setback and demolition permit number 17029 for the demolition of the existing single family residence and on-site development. Next slide, please. Here we have the site plan. Uh, next slide, please. Shown in the center, outlined in yellow, is the proposed single family residence and attached garage. Shown in red 
is the second story portion of the proposed residence, which is not to exceed 18 feet in height. Shown in green is the proposed swimming pool, and shown in orange is the 50-foot blooptop setback. And shown in yellow line, and then closed with a yellow rectangle towards the top right of the slide, is the setback for the requested 50% reduction of the required front yard setback at 32 feet 6 inches as noted on the project plan. However, the development starts at 53 feet. And I also included a, a yellow dimension line and uh, uh, the, the 53 foot, uh, just to call out. Uh, next slide, please. This exhibit shows the location of the required 22 foot view corridor, which is shown in the gray, the gray hatch pattern. Um, as shown in the project plans, there are portions of the development within this area. However, the project design provide the required view corridor across the property as viewed from Birdview Avenue. So I highlighted uh, in yellow the portions that's encroaching on the view corridor as shown in the project plans. However, when you stand on Birdview Avenue, it's all below road grade elevation. Uh, and uh, therefore, it uh, provides the required view corridor. Next slide, please. Here we have the basement plan and per LIP section 3.6 K6, it states the initial 1,000 square feet of a basement shall not count towards the total development square footage. Additional area in excess of 1,000 square feet shall be counted in the calculation of TDSF at the rate of one square foot of TDSF for every two square feet of proposed basement square footage. Here we have a proposed 1,080 square foot basement, which results in a new 40 square foot basement counted towards the TDSF. Next slide, please. Here we have the proposed 6,048 square foot first floor, which includes the attached garage and covered areas above six feet. Next slide, please. Here we have the second floor plan um, as proposed at 643 square foot on uh, second floor, not to exceed 18 feet in height, which consists of a, a gym and yoga room with a bathroom. Next slide, please. Here we have the proposed roof plan. Next slide, please. Here we have the proposed east elevation as viewed from Birdview Avenue. Shown in green is a dense tree which will be removed. The development is located in front of this existing, um, this existing tree. And then also on this elevation, we have the call out at 18 feet and it's showing that the development is all below the 18 foot mark. Um, next slide. Here we have the proposed north elevation. And again, you see at the top a, uh, a dotted line, which is the projection line above 18 feet. And it's showing that the development is all below that uh, projected um, 18 feet height. Next slide, please. Here we have the west elevation. Similar to the other elevations, we have a, a, a dashed line showing the projected 18 feet and showing the development below that. Next slide, please. Here we have the south elevation, similar to the other uh, elevations showing the dashed line at development below 18 feet. Um, next slide, please. Here we have story pool photographs. In the top left, we have views from the existing driveway. You could see the, the orange mesh in front of the tree, and then there's also the orange mesh showing on the driveway. To the right of that, we have a south view from Center of Birdview Avenue, and we have all this uh, existing vegetation, which is proposed to be removed, um, and they have a landscape plan to be compliant with the hedge um, heights. Below, to the left, we have view looking southwest from Birdview Avenue. Again, you just see a lot of uh, existing mature vegetation, and to the bottom of that, we have, um, we have a view from the rear of the property. So the biggest image is viewed from the center of the subject property. Next slide, please. Furthermore, staff conducted a series of in-person and remote meetings with the adjacent neighbor at 7237 Birdie Avenue to discuss the project. The concerns were provided to the project applicant and property owner. All correspondence received to date was either provided in attachment five of the staff report or distributed as correspondence if received after the agenda was published. In summary, that recommends that the Planning Commission adopt resolution number 21-60, approving the proposed project as conditioned. This concludes my presentation. The applicant and staff are available for any questions you may have. Additionally, 
City Geotechnical Consultants are also available for questions. Sorry, thank you, DDA. Before we get to uh, questions for staff, let's do disclosures. Dennis, would you like to go first? Uh, just talk to everybody last time this was up. Um, uh, we haven't done disclosures on this before, right? We didn't do it last time we... Thought we did. We just, we just continued it, right? The first thing was because we received correspondence, so we never actually made a presentation. Right. We, right. ne we never called the item and took disclosures. Let's just right. do it again. If anyone has any disclosures from either one of those last time. Right. Yeah. So, Dennis, if you have anything else, yeah. I did. I spoke with, with uh, Mr. Schmitz and uh, Mr. DeWall. Okay. John? You're muted. Still muted, John. Still muted. There you go. There you go. Um, I did speak with Don. Very brief. I, learned, I basically said I knew everything I needed to know, and uh, that was that. Mark? Uh, yes, I met with Don Schmitz on the site. Uh, I didn't learn anything new that's not in the reports. Uh, I also met with the neighbor uh, directly to the west. Okay, and uh, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I visited the site with uh, Don Schmitz the first time this matter was going to come before us. Um, had a subsequent conversation with him, uh, nothing beyond uh, what was in the staff report. I also uh, sent an email to um, to staff uh, regarding the uh, uh, the application having to do with the 50 foot, 100 foot setback issue. And that's, mm -hmm. I guess, now part of the public record. Yeah, we got that. Um, and I toured it with Don Schmitz the first time around, also spoke with him on the phone once, uh, not long after that. I've spoken with the neighbor and her representative, Jamie Harnish. Um, I, I saw how their view would be impacted. I saw from the road visually, that, looking at the story poles, that the east side of the project would penetrate into the view corridor, and I'll talk about that more. I noticed out front on the bluff that the chain link fence had the the chain link fence has tipped over, um, suggesting erosion there. Um, and in addition to the nearby slide that we have been seen YouTube video and still frames from, I know of a similar sudden slide event of similar scale further west on the same bluff, um, somewhat closer to where Birdview comes down to the ocean. Um, but a, a, a similar mass event. And then finally, I spoke with a neighbor, Brian Merrick, about the views, but also about the drainage on Birdview and how it has not been perfect and tends to pond there some, and that there, there may be some issues there that we need to resolve about how that works. Uh, Dennis? I also, I forgot, I did speak with uh, Ms. Ritter and uh, Mr. Harney. Okay. Commissioner Smith, did you learn anything from your contacts um, that's not in the staff report? I did not. Okay, so we've got that. How about any uh, questions for staff before we open up the public hearing? Any hands? Any John? Just a very quick question. Um, on, on the landscape plan, <clears throat> even in the blown up size, you can't figure out what plant is what plant. Um, are there any prohibited plants in there? And since they're mostly planting uh, in on in the view corridors is there anything that in the first third of the property that grows over six feet tall and in the the other two thirds is there anything that grows over say 10 feet tall <clears throat> i got every magnifying glass i could get i think that's for dda yeah you're muted dda you're muted No, I think we could hear you. <laughs> I couldn't. Come back. Oh, there you are. Okay, so looking at the landscape plan, because I don't remember there being anything that grows above six feet, and you are correct, uh, John, 
when looking at the landscape plan, it is kind of hard to see from, from our PDF. But from my review and the biologist review, I don't believe that there's anything above six feet um, would go within the required view corridor. However, we could just add a condition if that would be something that would uh, make you feel better about the decision. Well, I, I did identify two, and one was an Australian strawberry and one was a Melaleuca, and both of those can grow. So I, uh, I'm going to suggest at the end we add that provision because this is a view corridor. Um, I have one question for staff, at least at least one, I guess just one now. Um, Richard tried to explain this to me, but I'm, I, maybe I'm just too dense, but they have found pseudostatic values greater than 1.0, but less than the 1.1 required. And um, Richard tried to explain to me how they, the methodology, methodology has changed and that um, 1.0 is the new 1.1. In, in, in to put it simplistically, but I, I didn't fully uh, fully grok that, and, and I figure that's probably worth calling out for everybody to make sure everybody understands. You know, that is a valid point, and that was part of the purpose of the memorandum that uh, came from our geotechnical uh, consulting staff, and that's once again why we have them here this evening. And I think the, the quick story of it is that the the guidelines that are in our LCP are from 2002. And in 2012, uh, those guidelines were updated to, to reflect just the latest science. And I'll let Lauren jump in from there <laughs> to make sure I don't mess this up too much. Uh, but essentially, there are uh, different uh, uh, factors they're using to uh, and studies to achieve uh, more I think accurate results would be the way to put it. Lauren, uh, yeah. So the question really is, if we're if a 1.1 is required, how come we're okay with a 1.0 something? Okay, so we've answered this. This is something we've had quite a bit of discussion on. We've gone round and round. The short answer is the project geotactical consultants are here tonight um, for the applicant. And they can tell you they reran the pseudostatic stability analysis uh, under the old methodology, which is to use a horizontal seismic coefficient of 0.2. And they came up with a factor of safety of greater than 1.1. So they reran the, the stability analysis under the old way they used to do it. It meets the 1.1. And you can ask them more questions about that. It also meets the current guidelines um, that we that the city has adopted, where we use a higher seismic coefficient, 0.35, which is more reflective of the type of shaking that we expect to experience in Malibu. And because the shaking is higher and more specific to the region, a factor of safety of 1.0 is, is acceptable. So, in effect, what we're being told is that the code is out of date. Here's what happened. When the LCP LIP was written, as Richard Adrian and all of us had a discussion the other day, the specific, it shouldn't have been specifically worded the way it was. It should have said current standards, right, for slope stability. And so now, since that time, the standard of, of, of practice that's been adopted in Malibu and in this region was updated. We updated the guidelines accordingly in 2013. The city adopted those guidelines as well. So then we ended up, the city has actually two conflicting adopted standards, right? The old one that's referenced specifically in the LCP LIP, and then the new, the newer one. Which isn't in the code. John, go ahead. Well, it, it is. It is, actually it is part of the adopted city municipal code. The, the right. 2013 guidelines is adopted by the city. Oh, you say it's, it's yeah, in right. the MMC. It's it, but okay. Go okay, John. Go ahead. Well, we're required to follow the LIP above the MMC. The MMC never trumps the LIP if it's more restrictive. So you're telling. Okay. Well, the project does. The project consultant's going to address that. No, I'm just saying. 
are you saying that uh, they don't need to address it if you can tell us this? They're saying they reran it according to the LIP principles and came up with 1.1 plus. Is that correct? Correct. But you oh, should hear right. that directly from them. Correct. That is what I am saying. Okay. So we are following the LIP. We're not violating it. Correct. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's open it. If there aren't any other questions of staff, let's open up for the, uh, the public hearing and start with the applicant. I think you need disclosure. Did we do disclosure? We did disclosures. Yeah. You can do it again if you want, but oh, no. I think, no, who, who do we have? Do we have Don? Is he uh, going to be leading? Good evening. Uh, the applicant team consists of Don Schmitz, the architect, Dan Murphy, geologist, Jeff Holt, and the owner, Rob Isaacson, is also available for questions. Okay, and so they, they will have uh, 15 minutes of which they can reserve any amount of time of that for rebuttal. John's familiar with the process. Um, yeah, I've done it once or twice, uh, Chair Hill. Before we start the clock, audio check. You all can hear me? We can hear you. Okay. And, uh, I'm going to uh, – I'd like to uh, uh, get this wrapped up in eight minutes. I'll have my own stopwatch going on here. And I just want to say that the others are here to answer questions, especially uh, Jay Colt, the consultant geologist. So uh, before we start the clock, can we get my PowerPoint up, please? Yeah, give us one second. We're just having a little bit of trouble. That's all right. Just, just as long as the clock's not running, I'm fine. You uh, <laughs> you do what you need to do. You've lost a second so far. I know. I'm, I'm very jealously looking at that uh, chair, Hill. I'm, uh, I'm not happy about that one bit. I'll give it to you on the back end. You are a magnanimous chair. Thank you, sir. <laughs> While he's looking for this, if anybody's got any questions of me they want to get out of the way right now or of uh, the consulting job. Hey, Don, just to let you know, it's because your file name says item 5D because I think this was the previous one. Anyway, give us one second. We'll have it up there for you. Okay. Oh, okay. That means you've been continued to January. No, item 4C. You see it right up there. Okay, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys are good to go. All right, let's that, let's get going. Thank you, everyone. I'm here on behalf of the applicants. Can we have the next slide, please? You're familiar with the area. You're familiar with the property. Uh, next slide, please. There you go. Uh, next slide. We've got to move things along here. So you're familiar with the area, and we're moving excruciatingly slow in the slide progression here. Uh, next slide. Is there a... There we go. Okay, so uh, basically, this is a clean sheets project. The only discretionary thing that we're asking for is the front yard uh, minor modification. Next slide, please. This project comports with every single aspect of, of the code. Next slide. Uh, in actuality, we are not asking uh, uh, for a, a uh, uh, as much of a minor modification for the front yard. Uh, the front yard setback uh, is 53 feet. The, the garage in that location will be 14 foot, 10 and a half inches. Next slide. Uh, in, in actuality, the uh, main part of the house will be the full 65 foot front yard setback. And the elevation there will be 16 feet. An important question was raised by my friend Brian Merrick. Would the minor modification increase the, the height of the house as seen by the neighbors over 18 feet? And it will not. Next slide, please. So uh, you can see here are the elevations for both the 53 foot and the 65 foot setback. And it's, they are both well below 18 foot. And you can see the heights are measured not from the top of the, the fill as uh, Mr. Ehrlich has asserted, but from the existing natural grade. Next slide, please. So uh, you can see that the surrounding front yard setbacks that in fact, we are far beyond what uh, is the average and what is the norm out there. We will not therefore be in inconsistent with the neighbor character. Next slide. Uh, so we have the 50 foot rear guard setback, the bluff top setback. Yes, Chair Maz, I appreciate your questions on the previous uh, item. Uh, we did calculate the uh, bluff erosion retreat. Next slide, please. Uh, the footprint of the building was already discussed by staff. Next slide. 
We uh, have uh, only 40 square foot of additional TDSF in the basement. We do have three foot of crawl space. Uh, this is so that we can put all the HVAC underneath the building and not have it on top of the roofs. Next slide, please. The impermeable lock coverage is increased. It is within the limits, and that is a good thing, as Chair Hill knows, uh, living in Big Rock, you want to reduce the amount of infiltration into a property to further stabilize it where necessary. Next slide, please. The, the drainage, uh, it's curious the objections which have been raised by the opponents about the, having deleterious impacts on bird view. All of the drainage is collected from the impervious surfaces and goes down the face of the bluff through a drainage pipe in a non erosive fashion to an outlet down on the bottom of Westward Beach Road. Next slide, please. This is uh, very common. You can see it in the area. This is, uh, of course, because the property sloped downward the way the drainage is handled on bird view. Next slide, please. This was in fact reviewed and approved by the City Department of Public Works. Next slide. And that had all the Q calculations and everything else. Some have said the property has not been cleared by the fire department. That is not correct. You can see that the fire department approved uh, both the vehicular and pedestrian access around the proposed project. Next slide, please. Uh, then when we're going through the process, we've been working on this for five years. Next slide. Uh, primary view determination started popping up and, and a 29239C line place. Next slide. So we went back and we did a redesign on the project. We we're supposed to be heard back in, in June or July, very recent. Next slide. And we went, we redesigned it and you can see the uh, westerly side of the property. Next slide, please. We removed that portion and we were scheduled for a hearing. Next slide, please. And we've been really trying to work with the neighbors. And then somebody else asserted that 1754 primary view determination. Next slide, please. I didn't think it, that uh, the project would impact their primary view, but the writing was on the wall that we needed to just plain make this a clean sheets project at 18 feet. Next slide, please. And so as referenced in the staff report, we have completely redesigned the, the entire project to be limited to 18 feet. Next slide. And so this is a second design iteration. Next slide, please, where you can see we've also reduced this portion down, bringing it to 18 foot. Next slide. The uh, elevations now are 1610 and 1410, and it's actually 12 feet as seen from the street, but this is above the existing natural grade. Next slide, or the bottom of the excavation. And this has reduced the visibility of the project, which looks at like 12 feet from bird view. It's reduced the, uh, the face of the building from 1300 down to 838 square foot. Next slide. And this uh, shows you the elevations. Next slide, please. This is existing natural grade. This is proposed grade. Next slide. And you can see the maximum height elevation. You can see we have faithfully uh, uh, limited it to 18 foot. Next slide. This is a detail of, of this area. Once again, uh, with the areas where we're doing fill, you can see where we still measure the height from the existing natural grade as we are required to by code. Next slide. So we were also trying to be considerate of our neighbor uh, next door at 7237 and uh, next slide. That's fine. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, it's not uh, garnered much uh, favor with her, but uh, next slide. We took the uh, primary view determination. You can see this is the pictures from her primary view determination. This is the existing house. Next slide. This is the significant improvement uh, that will come from this project to her views. Next slide. Her designated primary view determination. This is her existing view. Next slide. And this is, will be after the new project. Next slide. You can see this project actually represents an improvement. This is her house there now. Next slide. This is the existing home. Next slide. And you can see that we are pulling it back. Of course, the house is 18 foot, so her primary view is not, not uh, relevant from a code standpoint, but we are trying to be as considerate as possible. Next slide, please. So the project's now reduced 18 feet in height. Site plan review is no longer required. It's a by right project and these primary view determinations are essentially irrelevant at this juncture. Next slide. So we should also talk about the bluff setback. You can see the, uh, uh, the subject property, the orange line is the edge of the bluff. You can see we are pushed much further up than others and the green line is the 50 foot setback. Next slide. So the 50 foot analysis was done by our consulting geologist. I'll probably hit that in, 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 in and thoroughly reviewed by the geologist with the city of, of uh, Malibu. Next slide, please. So this is the existing residence, which we will be removing. Next slide. 
Uh, this is the minimum 50 foot setback. Next slide. By the way, the calculated bluff retreat is, is not anywhere near 50 feet. Uh, uh, you can see the set systems located uh, as far back as possible. Next slide. Uh, this is the location of the house. Next slide. And this is what's really critical and what's different about this property. You can see we have an excellent orientation to the bedding planes here, which makes this particular piece of property and that bluff base very strong. And by the way, that fence out there, it doesn't look uh, at Cherry Hill like it's uh, been subject to erosion. It looks like something big rolled down into it. And that fence has been there for over 60 years. Uh, that's a pretty good indicator that this bluff is not eroding away. Next slide, please. So the rear yard setback that we will have here at 202 feet will be the greatest rear yard setback in Birdview. This will be the safest house on this entire street. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see that the average is 170 feet and we are gonna have 202 uh, uh, foot uh, rear yard setback. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This has been reviewed exhaustively. Mr. Ehrlich, who I'm sure will be speaking, made this sound like the city geologist simply rubber stamped our application. It's just absurd. Uh, it was reviewed and reviewed and reviewed again. It was an exhaustive review and it has been essentially peer reviewed by the city's uh, consulting geotechnical engineers and geologists. Next slide, please. Uh, there's been some assertions uh, that there was ESHA impacted, both by uh, uh, the neighbor in opposition to the project and the earlier staff report. Staff has now uh, addressed that. It is not ESHA at all uh, in the proximity or on this property. Next slide, please. As you can see, existing fuel modification zones by our LCP are not considered ESHA. And this entire area, next slide, is all within the fuel modification zones for all the surrounding and subject development. There is no ESHA on this property. The fuel modification zones go right down to the parking lot. Next slide, please. And this is reflected in the, in the ESHA maps uh, in our LCP. Next slide. So with that, please stop the clock. And I would just uh, like to retain uh, the remaining, uh, I think it's six minutes that I have uh, for rebuttal. You're muted, Chair Hill. Thank you, Dennis. Who do we have among the public speakers? I think we probably want to hear from, I think there's one group that have a more coordinated sequenced presentation of their three minutes following each other. Uh, should we hear from them first? Patricia, how do, what do you have on your side? So this will be the first time we're doing this with deferred minutes. So there's one way we could do this where we can ask folks to raise their hand. We could call on each person and then figure out who they're going to defer time to. Or I can announce, for example, Jack Jackson McNeil is the next speaker. Please raise your hand if you are deferring time to that speaker. Um, so well, so there's some confusion about wh whether people need to be deferred or not. I know from past experience that when there are opponents and each person wants to speak, they've presented organized presentations where each speaks their three minutes and they they go in sequence. And so they they address different issues. And so they avoid repetition. And I think that's what these guys are talking about doing here. Um, the deferred approach would make more sense if there are people that have a lot of people who want to say mostly the same thing or or don't necessarily want to speak at all and just want to okay. hand it over to somebody else. Okay. Um, Ken, Ken, Ken Ehrlich's got his hand up here. Maybe he can uh, enlighten us what his intent here is here. So we open his, please. Ken gets 15 minutes, right? Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's what we were asking for, we have a number of speaker slips in. In trying to make this, frankly, quick and to save everybody time, we have a coordinated approach where I'm going to speak, we have our consulting geologist who wants to speak, and then my colleague, and that would be the sum total of our presentation. We propose that would be, if you can give us 15 minutes, we will certainly try to take as little as possible and probably take, let's say, four minutes for rebuttal. But I think we, if you actually amalgamate all the time that our folks have, we probably have far in, far in excess of 15 minutes. And first off, can you please speak, you're on speaker funk. If you could be closer to the mic, that would be helpful. Um, so, uh, 
my understanding is that people get three minutes each, and if you have a lot of people, then they can each take their three minutes, but we don't automatically allocate the time to the opponents. Let's hear from Craig. His hand up. Yeah, Chair, Chair Hill, for, uh, just to clarify, there's no rebuttal. This is not an appeal. Right. So this, uh, you know, this is public comment. So th they have three speakers, he said. Each would have three minutes. If they have people that want to donate to those speakers, then they should identify who those are. Um, maybe, maybe you want to do what um, Patricia was suggesting, ask everyone who wants to donate time to raise their hand and we can just take a notation, do it all at one fell swoop of anybody who's donating and then she can keep a list of how long everyone's allowed to speak. If that That's would... a good idea. Jo John has a comment. John? I'm a little confused. Uh, we have an applicant here, correct? We and... have, no. We have a neighbor who has a coordinated uh, rejoinder, so... No, no, I understand that, but we're... we're uh... We're approving a CDP, right? We may be. What your point is? Then you usually have an applicant. You just had it. We just had the applicant. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I got you. So what you're saying is what we've done in the past is we've had people collect speaker slips, which we can't do here, who want to talk together, three minutes apiece. And then we've had people who deferred time. Right. So we, they can do either under, right. under, under our, our procedures. So, so are you saying we have a group that has wants to? We that, we, we have we have we have three people who want to do three minutes each, and we're going to find out momentarily whether we have other people who would like to donate time to let those three people talk even longer. Correct, Patricia. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay, you have to donate. If, they, if they're going to speak three minutes each, they have to donate to one person, not not to three. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, you're correct. We're just going to gather everybody that wants to donate it, and they can each donate one minute. They have to designate which person gets that minute. Instead of having a speaker card, we're going to have the people one by one say who they're donating it to. Right. Or they can have themselves called serially and do three minutes each. Right. Okay. Right. So let's let's Patricia, let's have a show of hands and see. Raise your hand if you're wanting to donate your time to somebody else. And Patricia, you can call them one by one and ask who they mean to donate to, and please take a record of that. Okay. So the first person I see here is Jamie. Is that Jamie Harnish? If you can unmute him. Yes, Jamie Harnish is here, and I would like to donate my time to Ken Ehrlich. Thank you. Robin Trento. Yes, I'm here, and I'm donating my time to Mark Johnson. Thank you. Joe Drummond. I can donate my time to Ken Ehrlich. Rebecca Ritter. Thanks, Roberta. Rebecca Ritter. She needs unmuting. I hear something faint. She's got her microphone off. Rebecca, if you if you want to donate time, can you indicate who you want to donate it to, or if you want to speak yourself? Let's circle back to Rebecca. Harry Ritter. I'd like to donate my time to Ken Ehrlich. Okay. And do you know about Rebecca Ritter? <laughs> yeah, she's having an issue with the phone. It was for Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson. We need to hear her say it. She's here. Can you have her just speak on your line? I'd like to give my time to Mark Johnson. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. Followed by Cassandra Ross. I'm donating to Mark Johnson. Followed by Etion Ribner. Ribner. Uh, 
I'd like to donate my time to Ken Ehrlich. Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands. Last call for raised hands to donate time. Okay, see Ken. none. Four minutes. So Ken, Ken Ehrlich has a total donation of four minutes, so that's seven minutes. Mark Johnson has a total donation time of three minutes, so that will give him six minutes to speak. Okay. Okay. Um, and you guys, all right. So I guess it's their choice, I suppose, who wants to go first. I'm imagining maybe Ken, right? If you don't mind, I'm going to put Ken first. Let me set the clock. Ken, the timer's I'm, ready whenever you're ready. Can I just make sure that the audio can be heard? Yeah, that's better. Great. So is it possible just before we start, can I donate some of my time to my colleague who was planning on doing part of the presentation, part of the same seven minutes? Does it matter, Trevor? No, it, it need to be donated. You, you, you can't take the time and, and reallocate it. You, you know, you would have to give up your own time, but you want that time. Um, if I have seven minutes, can I give of my seven minutes to somebody else? What we could do is we could confirm that the, whoever donated that minute to you, uh, they, they want to give it to the, somebody else rather than you. Looks like Joe just raised her, raised, her, raised her hand. Maybe we can have her switch who she donated to. Well, well, his name is Jackson McNeil. So, I mean, at least two minutes we need for Jackson McNeil, please. Well, he gets three minutes. Minute. Right. He, he gets three automatically, and if he needs more than three, then then you can re we can have people reallocate their contribution right. to you to him. If, if he gets, we're already spending way too much time on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If we don't mind, can we get our our PowerPoint up before we start the clock? You've got that on hand, Alex. I have a quick question: Do we have Jackson and Neil speaking? He's, he's right here next to me. I'm right here. But has he, has he signed up to speak? Yes, Jackson yes, McNeil has signed up to speak earlier today. Okay. Thank you. Great. So we're ready when you guys are ready. We're, we're ready, ready. When you can. Yeah, go ahead. Great. With, uh, with deference to my good friend, Coach Lee Corso, on college game day, I was listening to, to Mr. Schmidt's presentation very closely, and I would just say, not so fast, my friend, because this project, as proposed, is way too big for this hillside and presents significant concerns for this community. Uh, the Ritter family went around neighbor to neighbor and got more than 20 signatures of folks who were against this project, as proposed, almost exclusively on the geological reasons. Nobody seems to mind about the front yard minor modification. Nobody cares, so that's an issue that's off the table. What everyone is concerned about and what the focus is, is the rear bluff, which hangs over the bluff, which Mark Johnson will talk about, and Mark has been, was the Coastal Commission's head geologist for 17 years and played a, a significant hand in drafting the Malibu LCP and LIP provisions on point. So we can hear it directly from the horse's mouth about how this violates the rear yard setback provisions. Above and beyond that, we have the, 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 the law itself says you need to start with a 100-foot rear setback. And you can only go down to 50 if you fulfill certain exceptions. That's what Commissioner Jennings was getting at in the previous hearing. Here, you just cannot make the findings necessary to reduce that 100 feet down to 50 feet. Now, concerning ESHA, the, the face of the staff report on page one, or certainly on page 10 as well, says there is coastal ESHA at the site. And it doesn't need to be mapped for it to constitute ESHA. ESHA is ESHA. So there either is or there isn't. But when the staff report says there is, then we go to LIP section 4.6.4, which again goes back to require the 100 foot setback. Oh, so we can move beyond the next slide, please. Here's all the different LIP provisions that this project as proposed violates. 
Now, the neighbors aren't saying, we don't want the project. The project looks like a really nice house. It just needs to be sized appropriately for the neighborhood and also to protect the geological integrity of the neighborhood, which suffered a major slide in 2017, a slide right around the corner on Point Doom in the last few weeks, and then more recently had a complete blowout of Westward Beach Road down below. So to say this is a stable, solid bluff is absurd in and of itself. It's not. This whole geological unit is moving. But that's our biggest issue. But in addition to that, we exceed maximum height, as, my, as Mr. McNeil will, will talk about. Neighborhood standards are an issue. The, the minor modification findings are an issue. And the flooding are all an issue. So at that point, I'm done for now. I, I'd love to defer the rest of my time. Well, if, we can, if there's questions, that's fine. Um, I'll defer to Mr. Johnson, who can take over from there and go into the technical details. We can move the slide as well, please. Thanks, Ken. To, to page uh, six. Six. Slide six. Thank you all. Well, oh, thank you, Ken. Um, good afternoon, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, as it was said, my name is uh, Dr. Mark Johnson, and I was the um, staff geologist for the Coastal Commission for 17 years. Excuse uh, me, one I moment. I'm sorry. Let me adjust the clock for Mark Johnson. You have a total of six minutes. I'm going to adjust the clock for you. One moment. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I was um, instrumental in uh, writing the LCP, particularly Chapter 10 of the of the LIP, which is uh, um, at stake here. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, the, the first thing that we need to establish in establishing setbacks from a coastal bluff is where exactly is the top of the coastal bluff. Uh, the applicant originally stated that the coastal bluff is about a, approximately 94 feet elevation. Uh, the city's geotechnical reviewer objected to that and with consultation with the applicant, they established 110 feet as the uh, edge of the bluff. Uh, Don Kowalski, who was the uh, city geologist for a number of years, uh, uh, refer showed that there was a railroad cut on many of the bluffs on these parcels, and that that railroad cut done in 1908 for the Ringe Railroad uh, creates a bench at, on the subject prop, property. And he proposed that the top of the bluff was at about 114 feet. And I uh, believe that uh, Mr. Kowalski is correct and that I chose 114 feet as the uh, top of the postal bluff as well. Next slide, please. Now, the slope stability is the primary uh, uh, issue that we need to decide as to whether or not a, um, a bluff is stable. The slope stability is usually expressed in terms of a factor of safety. That is, we take the forces that resist the landslide, which is uh, generally the strength of the rocks and soils. And critical in here is the soil strength parameters, which I can go into in more detail if there's a question. And we divide those forces resisting a landslide by the forces driving a landslide, which is essentially the weight of the rocks along a potential failure plate. In practice, you test hundreds of potential uh, failure surfaces, and the one with the lowest factor of safety is the one that is most likely to occur. We add earthquake forces in a separate analysis by adding a, which is called a pseudostatic analysis by adding the earthquake forces to the driving forces. Now, the LAP states quite, um, quite succinctly that a static factor of safety of 1.5 is the standard for a stable slope, and a pseudostatic uh, factor of safety of 1.1 is required. 
Now, that is the language of the LCP, and unless there has been an LCP amendment, which I do not believe there has been, that is the law. That is the language of the LCP. Whether or not there are new geotechnical codes put forth in 2013 or not does not matter. The LIP is the standard of review here. So, CalWest downgraded the soil strength parameters that they had determined by uh, analysis for colluvium, and there was no real justification for that. They just stated that there was no confining pressure for colluvium and used a, a lower strength parameters than what they were determined by laboratory tests. They determined along two different cross sections along the, uh, through the bluff, uh, that, uh, static factor of safety of 1.64, a pseudostatic uh, factor of safety of 1.0228. And on the other cross section, it was a static factor of safety of 1.76 and a pseudostatic factor of 1.02. Now, those are clearly below the, the LIP requirement of 1.1. No evidence of how far back from the bluff edge it is, it is necessary to move before you get a pseudostatic factor of 1.1. That analysis was not done. So, the slope stability analysis, I would argue, is inadequate for four reasons at least. One, there was no justification for the soil strength parameters. They had a number of tests done, laboratory tests, and then they were somewhat arbitrarily reduced. The pseudostatic analysis did not demonstrate the LIP required 1.1 factor of safety. Only circular failure surfaces were evaluated. Uh, Wedge-shaped failures were not estimated. And then, probably most importantly, next slide, please. Next slide. There has been no consideration of the documented ongoing ground failures has been presented. Okay, I think that's all that we need to see about it. Could we go on to the next slide, please, slide 10? Yeah, this is a, an additional um, uh, more slides is there. So the 100 years of erosion, the applicant looked at the resolution of historic aerial photographs, and they were not able to locate the bluff edge in most of those. So they, just based on the resolution that they assumed for the or aerial photographs, they assumed that uh, there may have been 10 feet of, of bluff erosion, which works out to 16.7 feet in um, 100 years. Koaleski reported three inches per year based on that railroad cut that was cut through the bluff and the degradation of it. Three inches per year works out to 25 feet. Now, Koaleski actually um, found me. a range of values up to 4.1 inches per year. Mark, that would, Mark can, can you finish your sentence? Your time is up. Just finish your um, sentence. Oh, okay, so that's all I wanted to say, that, uh, that Kowalewski would have given you about a 34-foot bluff setback. Okay, thank you. Um, who do we have next? Um, we have um, Roberta Ritter. Is did, next? Did um, no. no? They wanted to. Uh, oh, Jackson McNeil. Yeah, yeah, One right. Second. One second. One moment. Okay, Jas Jackson McNeil, let us know when you're ready. Ms. Sarazar, before I begin, can you bring the pre presentation back up because I'm actually using the same presentation. 
Thank you. And you can start, uh, when you get to the next slide, I'll be done. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can tell, uh, Mark could go on and on about all the problems with the bluff analysis and all the reasons why the rear setback proposed by the applicant is incorrect, and I encourage you to ask him questions. But let's not forget that this project is unlawful for other reasons. First of all, the proposed project violates the 18-foot height limit. You heard the applicant kept telling you uh, the project's no more than 18 feet above the existing grade. Well, that might be true, but the LIP sections 3.6E and 2.1 specifically require that height be measured from natural grade or finished grade, whichever is lower. And as you can see from the um, plan excerpts in this slide, there are several places in which the applicant incorrectly measures height from existing grade, even when finished grade is several feet lower. Uh, this results in a project that is taller than allowed, period, full stop. Next slide, please. Uh, next, the project also violates neighborhood standards. We recognize that the minor modification findings require the project to be compatible with the neighborhood character, not neighborhood standards. But Section 3.6L of the LIP requires the commission to determine that a project does not violate neighborhood standards when, as here, the applicant has requested a minor modification for decreased setbacks. But in our mind, it doesn't really matter whether you want to call it neighborhood character or neighborhood standards. The essential question, the essential standard is whether the project is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Next slide. Here, this project would stick out, stick out like a sore thumb. It's twice the size of the average house on Birdview Avenue. It's three times the size of the house that it replaces. It's almost 2,000 square feet larger than the next largest home. And let's not forget, this project doesn't just seek um, a, a really large house, massing-wise. It, it's asking for a reduction of the front yard setback. It's asking for an unlawful and dangerous reduction of the rear yard setback. It's asking for the maximum possible height allowed, and then some. And it's asking for significantly more floor area than any other house on the block. This is a project that is out of character with the surrounding community if there ever was one. The project must be revised before it can be approved. Next slide, please. Finally, the findings for a minor modification cannot be made. To obtain a minor modification, you need to be consistent with the LCP. You can't adversely affect neighborhood character, and you have to comply with all applicable requirements. Here, these findings can't be made. I've just shown you the project does not comply with the neighborhood character. It is way out of character, and it is certainly not consistent with the policies of the LCP, including the height limit and including the required rear setback. Next slide, please. In conclusion, this is an enormous home uh, sited unlawfully and perilously close to a coastal bluff with a documented history of landslides and erosion. Mark Johnson, the Coastal Commission's primary geologist, has told you that the reduced rear yard setback is simply not supported by the evidence, yet the applicant continues to push for this outsized mansion strongly opposed by virtually all of the neighbors. In short, the facts and evidence do not support the findings, the project violates the LCP, and the Commission has no lawful choice but to deny the project as presently proposed and we are around and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jackson. Uh, who do we have next? We have two remaining speakers. We have Roberta Ritter followed by Isaac Ritter. Okay, let's hear from Roberta, please. Didn't Roberta Ritter, get, Ritter give her time to? Uh... No, that was, that was Rebecca Ritter. I'm sorry. This is this is Bobby Ritter. Okay, gotcha. But I gladly would they, answer any questions. Not, uh, hold on, they didn't hear us. My hand is raised. Um, yeah, your hand is raised. I hear that. Are you? Is Bobby with you right there? Yes. Yeah, I'm right here. I gave my time to Mark Johnson. It, there's a Rebecca Ritter, which is my daughter-in-law and myself. And, and I would like to give my time to Ken Ehrlich at this time. I think Ken if actually Ken actually had a few minutes left, or I'm not sure how much exactly, but he didn't use quite all his time. Um, if, if I could use one minute now, I'd, less than one minute, I'd appreciate it, Mr. Chair. And I think our presentation will be done. Um, okay, go ahead. Thank you. 
a final thought to leave you all with is that in light of the cliffside landslides, we understand that applications have either been filed or are pending to um, remove pools from two of the three following homes at 29150, 29140, and 29208 cliffside. There's one of those three properties where the pool is actually being proposed to be moved to the street side of the residence. But the two others, in light of those slides, the pools are going to be removed. We think that's significant in light of the proposal here, which is in the same geological unit. Jamie and, and, and with that, we will end our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Patricia, do we have anybody left? We have Isaac Ritter. Ah. Would Isaac Ritter like to use three minutes? Uh, yeah, I, I donated my time, so uh, we, we should keep going. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Since we have gone through all the names of people that have signed up to speak prior to the hearing, are there any other speakers in the Zoom meeting? Please raise your hand if you would like to speak. I don't see anybody. I don't see any hands either. Okay. Um, first, a, a, a little piece of housekeeping. It's 10 o'clock now, I believe, ish, 10 straight up. Um, we've got a couple other items after this tonight. Do Should we take a vote to see if we want to send one or both of them home already? Or, or do, what, what's the temperature? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Do you mind, uh, if we've just finished the public uh, hearing, if we, Don Schmitz has a rebuttal, we could do that. And then if you want to take up that item to continue. Oh, you're right. He has rebuttal. That's correct. Thank you. Um, let's hear from Don and then we'll deal with the housekeeping. Holy cow, you give me heart palpitations over here. Before we start the clock, can we get my uh, PowerPoint back up to where we uh, left it last? It's good for your health. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I, I have uh, six minutes left. So next slide, please. That was a lot to unpack. The regulatory constraints have driven the design of this house. Next slide, please. Uh, there's no question that the uh, project is not more than 18 foot. Your staff can speak to this. You've seen this many times. The definition of grade in the municipal code does not include notching down in or basements or anything. It's a complete twisting of the code to say that any part of this house is taller from 18 foot from existing natural grade or the bottom of the excavation. It's just simply not true. Next slide, please. And, and this is this is shown on the plans. I need to move on. Next slide, please. So uh, we have reduced the height of the structure uh, as requested. So uh, it would be very diminutive from the street side. Next slide, please. And the grading and drainage plan is incontrovertibly correct. It's been engineered. There's been no uh, engineering Q calculations submitted by the opponents and the grading and drainage plan was reviewed by the city department of public works and approved. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This will have the largest rear yard setback on Birdview. Next slide, please. In regards to the definition of the edge of the bluff, uh, we are in fact completely consistent with the uh, requirements in our LCP for that definition. And in fact, the city pushed us back pretty far. We have one of the most aggressive and most pulled back bluff edge setbacks. Next slide, please. The, the thing that fascinates me, especially about uh, uh, Mark Johnson's testimony, is that he compounded and, and misapplied things. Let's, look, let's just cut to the chase here. The reality is, is that in this particular case, there was a specific analysis done for bluff retreat for a hundred year lifespan of the project. I don't understand why some folks were not paying attention when it has been presented to this commission by the staff that both means of analyzing the pseudo-static stability of the property were used. Everything that the city has done since 2013 and a supplemental reflective of the LCP. And so in both cases, we are consistent. And we have the bluff retreat, but, but we analyzed 16.7 foot of 100 years of bluff retreat. Adding a 10 foot buffer, that's 26.7 feet. If you use Mr. Johnson's analysis, 
doubling the amount of bluff edge retreat, that would be 34 feet. Plus with a 10 foot buffer, we would still be fine. The 50 foot is the absolute minimum that we have to have. And that's where we left it by their calculations or our calculations. We are fine in both instances. Next slide, please. And I'm going to wrap it up with this. 3004A specifies that the city, as having a certified LCP, is given maximum flexibility on analyzing their LCP. I'm actually going to cover a couple other points. Uh, and that includes how we calculate it. But luckily, we calculated the slope stability factors of safety and the bluff retreat both ways. Next slide, please. And... I was somewhat taken aback by Mr. Ehrlich's comment. Well, if it's ASHA, it doesn't matter if it's MAP. Let's look at this again. 3.1 of the land use plan specifies that fuel modification areas are not ESHA. That is the law. Next slide, please. This is the overlapping fuel modification zones for the surrounding house. There's absolutely no ESHA on this property. Your staff will speak to this. It cannot be considered ESHA. There's no additional uh, setbacks from ESHA for this property, period. There is no ESHA. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And uh, we've already spoken in regards to the front yard setback. One attorney said that nobody had a problem with the minor modification. The other attorney said it was, it was horrible. Clearly, the minor modification for the front yard setback is, is more than compatible with what the neighborhood character is. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that old canard in regards to beginning to average the size of the house and whatnot. It, you know, that's just simply not the law. And, that, and this commission is just way too sophisticated to fall for that. Next slide, please. Uh, so in regards to the neighborhood character, I have a lot of slides I could cover, uh, but I'm not going to. Just one or two. Next slide. Let's just roll through a couple of these. The vast majority of the houses in the area are two stories in height. Next slide. The neighborhood compatibility is, is very clear. Next slide. 29 of the 40 single family residences on Birdview are two stories, 73%. Next slide. Next slide. Just go through these fast. Next slide. Next slide. You can see that we're not proposing anything special. In fact, we will be less visible than uh, the vast majority of the homes are. So let's stop here. There is nothing more than 18 foot in height. There is no site plan review. Your staff has, and you have analyzed many, many projects. By the way, Commissioner Hill, Chair Hill, excuse me, uh, you mentioned you had concerns that the one section on the easterly side is, is too tall. I will accept any condition you think appropriate, sir, that, that we resurvey that and make sure that we're not getting into the view corridor. There's no site plan review determination. There's no primary view determinations. This is a clean sheets project. We have proven out the 50 foot uh, setback being appropriate. In fact, almost double what uh, the anticipated and calculated bluff retreat will be using both of the different standards, that in the LCP and in the 2013 standards from the city. So with that, I've exhausted my 15 minutes. I would uh, ask you to please feel free to ask questions of uh, Mr. Holt, who has been doing geology for 30 years plus in this area. I thank you very much for your time and we are available for any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, and I think now we are closing the public hearing, at least formally, um, back to the table. Uh, matter of housekeeping first, it's now somewhat after 10. We have three other items after this. Do we want to, what's the appetite? Anybody have any thoughts about how many we can or might not hear tonight? So, so we, if there's somebody to send home, let's do it now. John? Well. Oh. The, the last two, I'm sure we're not going to hear. I don't want to hear anything after 1030. So the first of the three, we can leave on the schedule if we finish on time, but we only have 20 minutes to do that. So your motion would be to continue the last two to uh, Richard when? Oh, you're muted. Patricia, if you don't mind jumping in here so I don't misspeak. But I think we have a pretty packed agenda, correct, for the 18th of January because we need to have the fire rebuilds uh, extension heard by the extensions heard by the commission. Yes, we have the extensions for the fire rebuilds 
However, most of the items have not been noticed. So I believe there may be room for these two items. And then the other ones would be pushed or just moved on the agenda to the February, March meetings at this point. We, we, we got to take care of the Tomlinson's, you guys. They're fire rebuild. They asked her, they sent a letter about trying to get out in front of the motion. That's that, John, John's, yeah. motion, John's motion is to keep them in tonight. If we finish this item before 1030. The motion is to continue items 5C and 5D and right. to a date certain. And that date certain, it, did you want the January, Richard, or did you want the February date? We could do the January date. Um, it'll just mean that we have to move those items because uh, well, we haven't noticed them. We have that flexibility. So do you want to, uh, uh, Commissioner Maza, it's your, it's your motion. Do you want to continue the items to the January is it 18th? I assume staff is telling me that they would prefer January. That's fine. Oh, no, that's fine with me. Is it January 18th? Did I get the date right, Richard? That's correct. Right the January 18th regular meeting of the Planning Commission. We have a second? Second it. Okay. Call the roll. Commissioner Maza? Yes. Vice Chair Smith? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Is Jeff's muted? <laughs> Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Wetton. Yes. Chair Boy, that, Boy, that was a pregnant pause. Yes. Um, okay. So we're back to this item then. Um, and I, I'll just say now, just uh, not that anything's happened so far, but if we start uh, calling in experts to enlighten us on particular details that it would be great if we could avoid the discussion of credentials or anything ad hominem and just focus on the facts in the law and sort of take it as read that all the geologists in the room have competence. Um, so that, that that's not part of the issue. I have, well, do we have any questions for staff that we haven't heard? Cause I, I had forgotten one. So I have one and I have one new one, John, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first, by the way, I'd like to state that there's a book called Malva Roads and Rails by uh, Ronald Ringe that clearly shows the railroad going across the property. Um, condition 25, uh, fencing and screening. Uh, I'd like the staff to look at that. I, I assume that they've made an error and considered this as a rural um, open property. They have the split rail requirement there. So I would, if that, if I'm correct on that, I, I will offer a motion later to uh, put the standard, got to follow code section, blah, 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 instead of the split rail. Okay. Do you want to put a pin in that? Are you waiting for staff reply? I, I wanted to just look at it. It shouldn't take a second. It's on page 9 of 22 of the resolution. Yes, the so condition 25 is for um, open rail type design wood fencing. I'm sorry, what? So you are correct. Condition 25 is for a split rail design. Okay, so that answers that. I'm going to make a motion on that. Um, and uh, very quickly, you can confirm that this house is not over 18 feet. That's correct. Okay, thank you. I'll continue you later. Didier, you, Didier, you can turn the gain down a little bit on your microphone. For some reason, you're a lot louder than everybody else now. Right, I'm having audio issues because I don't even know what's going on with it. It says that I'm not muted, but I'm muted. So it's kind of coming in and out. It, your microphone is, is overloading and distorting. Anyway, um, okay, my, my question that I forgot to ask is, and this is uh, geotechnical, and um, this is for staff. I don't know, if, is, is Lauren here or who, who on the staff is? Anyway, uh, or, or uh, I see Lauren and Michael, okay. 
There are six borings further up on the site to depths of 40 to 50 feet. Um, but in the vicinity of the bluff, there are no borings. There are only two test pits that go, one goes three feet and one goes 18 feet respectively. Why, what, what it, does that mean anything? What, is that significant that the, the deep borings were only done further up the hill? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, those, the, the cluster of deep borings that were done further up the hill were primarily for percolation testing. Okay. Uh, that's why there was a large number of them. They did a deep boring uh, in front of where the new house is going or in front of the, the current house. And yeah, they did a shallower one on the bluff. But what's more important, Commissioner Hill is, uh, Chair Hill, is that, uh, you know, the geologists mapped the bluff. Um, they mapped the terrace bedrock contact on the bluff. That's the first thing they do. And they've got bedding attitudes in the Monterey Formation on the bluff. Um, that gives you a, a location on that bluff. And uh, you have that same location uh, in the borings that they downhole logged. And it's pretty much, it's an exercise of connecting the dots. Uh, that, that's why that terrace bedrock configuration looks the way it does in the cross section. Okay. And it, that is a wave cut platform. That's a well-known uh, terrace that's uh, in the literature. And um, it's, it's a very reasonable uh, uh, cross section. Okay, thanks. The other question that I that just occurred to me, I, I, I had thought, and when I talked to Don, we thought that uh, runoff had to be channeled and gathered and somehow pumped to the public street, that that was the, the rule. And now for the first time I'm seeing, uh, and maybe I just missed it in the report, that it's all going to a downpipe that's going down to Westward Beach. Do we have public works on board with, with that, putting the drainage down there? Is, is that that's a standard practice along there as opposed to being sort of a bootleggy thing that people just end up running pipes down their hill? I, I can actually answer that. I don't think we have public works with us tonight. Don okay. did present, I did see the applicant present um, a public works approval. I was not the reviewer for this particular project, but I can tell you what public works has said, um, and you can ask them, they don't like sump pumps. Sump pumps, uh, when the power goes out, sump pumps fail and then you don't control the drainage. So you always want to choose gravity drainage if you can, if that's an option. And, and I guess the question would be, has it, have we looked at the interaction with what that does with the road and or the beach down below? Um, I suspect some of the historical ones along there, nobody ever looked at it. But, you know, it's 2021 now. We look at those kinds of things now. Um, do, do we know? I I, 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 presumably what, what you do have to do, because we've done this on the fire rebuilds, and I know we've got a number of fire rebuilds that, you know, are, are running drainage down and we've, we've made them uh, collect their drainage at the top because their fire rebuilds and their grandfather to build at the top of these steep slopes, right? Um but they have to run the hydrologic calculations for the velocity, right? <laughs> that goes down and then you have to design a, a dissipator at the bottom that matches that. And so some of these pipes, we can't run them as far down the hill as we want because you end up with these huge dissipator structures because the velocity is so much. So that is something that they do require. They require hydrologic calculations when you're running pipes down the slope and you have to design a dissipator. Mm -hmm. John has his hand up. Yeah, um, I've lived on that. That I lived on that uh, bluff or a similar bluff for 16 years, and then I've, I've lived 30 years within 500 feet of it. So I've walked the beach a million times. Uh, and when we always, and most of the slides, in my opinion, are caused by overwatering. They never never really happened before 94. But in, in the case of Malba Road and, and quite a few other projects, we required a collector tank at the top that, that fed the water over, over the side. And uh, one on the case of silver on PCH on Malba Road, it was 50,000 gallons. So I wonder how much is collected. Don showed some 
picture of some kind of collector system at the top of the bluff. And do you know what size of that and whether that holds the capacity? Um, that's the first question. Number two is we're not allowed to uh, make any any development at all on a coastal bluff other than a public trail. Um, so if we have massive collector systems at the bottom, are we? Are, is this part of this approval? I don't see them on any plans. Our dissipation systems, I mean. Yeah, who is that for? Yeah, I guess Laura or whoever Public Works is. Yeah, that's, that's Public Works. That's not me. I was just providing commentary about uh, what Public Works has said to me and all the discussions we've had about pumps versus gravity. Right. Yeah, well, I think that's in general. Uh, I know on at least the Paradise Cove side, um, those black pipes were grandfathered, and you're not. And from what I've seen, you're not allowed to put them in on a new structure. Um, yeah, that was my understanding. Because of, mainly because of the requirement to clean the water to TMDL zero because it's a, a water, re, whatever they call it, a clean water reserve and a fish reserve. Um, I don't know if, we, if Public Works knows about that or whether they considered it. Don Schmitz has his hand up. Maybe he yeah. could enlighten you. Yeah, before we get to Don, can we hear from Richard or DDA about this? What, because... It's, this wasn't clear in the plan that, that we're piping down the hill and we need a dissipator structure and all that. I mean, it seems a little problematic that suddenly we're interacting with the public beach down there, et cetera. So staff? So the grading plan does show the the energy dissipator at the bottom. Okay. It, it also shows uh, the pipe uh, that will run down the, the top of the, uh, the, the face of the bluff there. Um, the, the catch here is that the LIP requires that the pre-development and post-development runoff levels remain the same. And our, uh, geo, or excuse me, not Geotech, Public Works staff is very aware of the ASBS uh, that was being discussed. And as part of what they do for the city, that is the city's um, stormwater discharge permits, and they, they do watch what not only the city does in terms of stormwater, but also when they review these uh, projects on folks' homes. And as uh, Lauren mentioned, the issue there is getting the water away from that, uh, the, the, the bluff, so to speak. And they don't want to relate, they don't want to rely on sump pumps. Uh, in this case, I, I'm not an expert on the geotechnical aspect of it, but there may be an issue with putting in a tank and a detention basin and slowly percolating water into the face of this. Yeah, I can see Lauren shaking her head. And so essentially water and drainage, they want to maintain a, the, the, the historical pattern. And so that's why you see the structures you do. And uh, these structures have been seen by the Coastal Commission. Uh, it's not development in the sense of a uh, building a building on the bluff or a uh, private staircase on a bluff. It's a matter of engineering. We allow these types of structures on slopes that are ESHA as well uh, because of the fact that we're looking at erosion and having to move the water, uh, it just following historic flow and not altering that. Richard? Okay, let, let's get 10 seconds from Don Schmitz to uh, keep his blood pressure down. <laughs> I am icy calm. Thank you, Chair Hill. Uh, yes, great questions. In actuality, it is shown on the plans, on the drainage plan. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a detention tank. It's 50 feet by 10 feet to meet the water quality and water polishing standards that the city requires. Uh, Richard's also correct that the uh, erosion control uh, energy dissipator at the bottom is shown. And uh, in actuality, the LIP does uh, specifically allow only uh, drainage devices down the face of the bluff like this. So this was something that was uh, pretty thoroughly vetted by both Public Works and the City Geology Department. And the plans are, we don't know the exact page, 
but they were produced by GeoWorks, uh, gentlemen, and that's where you'll find the uh, uh, the detention tank. It's called a lid. A lid. Okay, but let's. I, I want to go to Ken, and then we'll come to Dennis, and then John. Ken, briefly. Someone on I mean, I'm just trying to. Uh, can you hear me now, Mr. Chair? Yes. For, I, I don't have the LIP in front of me, but I'm not aware of any exception to the Coastal Act's definition of development, especially on a coastal bluff. So I have no clue as to what LIP provision Mr. Schmitz is talking about that's going to allow a drain that's going to permit a drainage pipe going down this hill. Okay. Well, John. Well, John is looking that up. Let's hear from Dennis and then John. I'm just going to say, you guys, the rain harvesters are something we have to put in everywhere on all new construction. That we, you have to do it. I, Tuna Canyon, I've got three 10,000 gallon uh, tanks coming down the main driveway. I've got a 34,000 gallon tank on lot one. I've got a 32,000 gallon tank on lot two. And I put a 34,000 gallon tank on lot three. This is nothing new. No, but you're you're not on a coastal bluff in front of a public beach either, which might you be a different. To, you've got to control your flow. That's what's going on here. That's Granted. The whole Granted. John? Well, Richard said you cannot increase your flow, okay? Now, that's what these detention tanks are for. You let it out slowly, okay? It doesn't appear that uh, a, what did Don say, five by 50-foot tank is that big. Um, you cannot, and, and by the way, I have never, I've walked that beach uh, maybe 3,000 times from Paradise Cove onward, westward. I've never seen uh, a, uh, an arrestor uh, on anywhere. In fact, I've never seen one in Malibu on the beach, okay? Uh, I've seen them in canyons and other places. So the, uh, there's two questions. One, is there an exception for this? Because I think Ken's right. Everything's prohibited except the, the way the code reads, and I don't have it in front of me. Everything, every, all development is prohibited. Fences, plants, landscaping, everything on coastal bluffs except a public trail. It's the only exception. So a grandfathered black pipe is no problem. Uh, if you notice some of the pictures that have been submitted, especially the latest landslide on the other side of the point, uh, it looks like that's what failed. It, it's laying there on the ground in the rubble. Um, yeah. So it's it's a really kind of big deal. Uh, and the only reason I bring this up is it's not like gives me great heartburn, but I'm assuming this is going to coast, and we've got to follow their rules. Yeah. Um, now the other point is we're dumping water on a state park. And uh, the, the boundary line is the parking lot. So is that cool? Can you flood the parking lot? Um, and and scenic, scenic yeah. visual impact there, maybe. So, and, well, okay. it, it, there is a pipe there, as I understand. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if there is or not. If there isn't, there's another big problem, I think. We're going we're gonna to wait. We're not, we're not going to wait. We're, we're going to move ahead with if people have other issues. Uh, oh, Don has. No, it's 10.4F. Oh, uh, that's the section that talks about public access ways and drainage devices that are allowed on a bluff face. And what does it say about drainage? What does it say? It says that they're allowed on bluff faces. Okay. Don, if that was your answer, you can put your hand down. Um, okay. I w I'd like to move oh, on. Yeah, to hand oh, no, it's down. Okay. It's down. Okay. Thanks. I'd like to move on to any other issues that people have. I have a couple. Um, and but let's hear from other people if there are other aspects that you want to discuss. Well, again, I, I, I'd like to make sure before I put the motion in uh, on uh, plants that our, our landscaping plan does have plants that are above can grow above six feet, so uh, or ten feet. Uh, that's correct. Okay. And then um, let's see here. And the other thing I want to confirm is that the uh, uh, understory uh, crawl space is three feet, not six feet. 
That's correct. Correct. Okay. There, there is one section of uh, utility room that's six feet. Okay. And uh, I just want to say that having walked the beach that amount of times, bedding slopes are where you have slides. If it's pointing up, you're not having one. If it's pointing down, you're going to have one. I've never seen one that points up. And you can walk all along Paradise Cove and see the bedding slopes sticking out. Some of them go straight up. Uh, some of them go straight down. But okay. really big factor. I'd like to get to a couple of my things. Well, let me just first say, I think that in terms of the geo geological stability, we're not all experts. We don't know. But I think they have demonstrated a fair amount of that pretty well. And there is a distinction to be made between this side of the point and Paradise Cove in terms of the orientation of the bedding slopes, right? That's that's just one thing that's become clear to us over time. I do have one of my one of my issues has to do with the 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 bluff edge definition. Uh, the applicant has called it at 110 foot elevation. Three other geologists who've weighed in have called it at 114 feet elevation. And we have we saw the uh, maps that Mark Johnson provided that with the hand drawn uh, the, the reinterpretation of what the top of the bluff edge is. And what seems pretty dispositive to me, apart from the fact that we have sort of a three to one on the on the interpretations, is that the applicant's official survey, the Don Nelson survey, has in tiny little letters written on it, has top of bluff edge demarcated along it. And it calls it out at different points along the contour. And it ranges from 113 to 116. I'm rounding. It's 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 to a hundredth of a of a foot, uh, but it's basically one thirteen something to I don't know one fifteen point nine eight or so. It's about one sixteen. So that to me seems pretty uh, dispositive that the bluff edge is more like the one fourteen that everybody else has said, and possibly even slightly higher. Which the effect of that would be. You could do basically what you've got proposed here, but you're going to end up having to move it back. I don't know how much, 10, 15 feet horizontally, if you're talking about a, a, a difference of a four or five foot vertical displacement, that's going to translate into something bigger than that. And that would mean pushing, pushing the project back, you know, 10, 15 feet, something on that order. Um, I see a lot of hands coming up. Um, that seems pretty just inarguable to me. Um, if people want to comment on that, if not, I can mo move on to another idea. You got some hands. They obviously do. <laughs> well, okay. If we want to hear from, yeah, Don, what do you, well, let's hear from you Don. You don't need to open it up for everyone to comment on that if you, if you don't want to. It's well, just... you know what? Actually, we do need That's to move forward. We do need to for move forward. I think we, and, and I think I've made my point pretty clearly that their own survey points that out. So. I'm, um, I'm not seeing that, Chair Hill. All I see is top of bluff. I do not see anything that says that it's that's the top of bluff. It shows the 50 foot setback, but it doesn't say anything that at the way it, it shows it at the 110 mark top of bluff. Can you tell us where to find this? Oh man, I you know what? I don't have the page number listed. Um, um on the Dennis plan. Plan. It's the original. It's the original survey drawing. It's not the one that has any um, color coding or or or. This is line. This is the grading plan. This is this is what I would read. Yeah, it's very tiny, tiny little print and it's and little. Bluff, and it's about the one ten mark. Uh, it's not the one that I have. It goes the the closest one is one thirteen something, and then it goes to nearly one sixteen. Is there a is there a a number on the plan or anything? I don't have it in front of me. I took it on the you know we've done this we had this ready to go weeks ago, and then I didn't gather that one sheet up this time. Um, I can go back to that if I can find it. Let me let's see. While I'm talking elsewise, I'll flip through and so see if I the rain harbor the rain harvesters are one twelve. So in the in the bluff is is it's one ten. It's exactly what Mr. Holt has. Um this might be the one hang on, let me get my close glasses. 
So Dennis, are you saying the rain harvester is down bluff or up bluff? It's up just a couple of feet, Commissioner Maza. So it's above Finish ground. The radar is 112. So it's above ground? Well, no, it's got a lid on it, but yes, kind of. It's right. It's at grade. So, Richard, how, while he's looking, uh, how do you have a, a, a collection tank above grade? It's not. No, the, the collection tank, it, it's all gravity fed. And once again, that's part of the drainage uh, system. And in the LIP, as I mentioned earlier, there's a provision that allows for drainage devices, and it talks about best management practices with these to be placed on the bluff. Okay, so, okay, I got you. The bluff goes from what some people contend is the bluff is 114, and it's between 114 and 110. The rain harvester. Rain harvesters that are 112 on the finished grade. The lid probably sits at grade. You got me confused, but never mind. Well, the lid has to be accessible, Commissioner Mazza, so it's sitting at grade. So a 112 with the tank itself, and the lid may be up an inch or whatever. Or they'll feather it in so it sits at grade. I'm not finding the, the, the map. Uh, there were two versions of the survey map. I'm, the new packet is different than what was in the old packet. So. Commissioner Hill, if I might yeah. just say yeah. the, the issue of bluff top and then bluff setback and also erosion. Um, I, I think I, I, I know that the project applicants geologists prepared remarks on that. Um, that also address actually some of the other questions that were raised or points. So I don't know well, if Jake, you might be able Jake to shed Holtz. some light on that for you. Is well, that, would that be Jake Holtz? Yeah, no, Jake has his hand raised, so. Yeah. So we might as well ask him. Yeah, if he, if he has specific recollection of the line I'm talking about, that would be helpful. If not... You know, I, I think we've we've talked about the stability and stuff a long time. I think it's just a question of is there that dispositive determination? He's the applicant's geologist. You need to let him talk. Yeah, let's hear him. But I, I will say that I think that there were some misstatements, but I don't want to be the one to correct them. I want to give the project geologist the op opportunity to do that. But I there were some misstatements or some uh, that, that need to be corrected. So. Okay, let's hear from him for a moment, for a minute. Yeah, hi, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hey, hey, good evening, yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, topographic top of bluff, you know, obviously that's the key element, it's the first thing that needs to be determined. On this site, our top of bluff at the 110 contour is conservative. If the railroad would have never have happened, and that kind of grading associated with that railroad, our top of bluff would be somewhere around the 94 to 96 contour. It is, it was artificially removed in the early 1900s, and we're actually being penalized for it because it has altered the terrain in that area. And that's one of the reasons I argued originally when I started this project, I think in 2016, around the 94 contour. So where we ended up agreeing upon the 110 contour is is a conservative uh, location of that line. And you know, I think it's overly conservative, but uh, whatever may be, that's what we accepted and agreed with, with the city's geotechnical staff and the planning department at that time. So that's, uh, I think that's indisputable now. And you know, that's again, what our 50 foot setback is based on. Okay, and, that's, that, that's good for now. I think, John? Yeah, I just wondered, are you, you saying that the railroad actually built the bluff up six feet instead of making a cut? No, they, they, they cut down uh, from what I can tell from photos and just looking at the terrain and looking at the adjacent properties, they cut material down to create a lower bench. And I think it removed our pre-existing natural bluff and essentially laid it back. So now we have a laid back situation. So we're more conservative than what it would have been. I understand. 
they're not getting any advantage over it if that's what you're asking okay my, my own take on this and and just being absolutely certain i did read that previously the map i'm talking about and understanding that there are three other uh expert determinations that all coalesced around 114 feet i i think that's Personally, I feel that is dispositive, and I, maybe we should move to another issue. Um, the view corridor on the side. I, I, I'm, I w I've t been told that there's no violation here because the fact that when you look at it on on from a plan view, the fact that the house extends into the view corridor is not relevant because the house is low enough down that when you're on the public street, you can look out horizontally and the horizontal line goes over the house. So the view quarter isn't violated. Now, to my understanding though, if that's the interpretation of what the view is, then it's patently absurd because that would mean that literally no house in Malibu has an ocean view. Because if you're only going out horizontally, if, you're, if your house is at elevation 10 feet above the ocean, uh, you, you're going out to the horizon and you're not counting anything below that horizontal line. It, it just seems completely counterintuitive to say that the view is only from the horizon, horizontal line up. So to me, the, uh, the fact that the house on the southeast side would bl block into that view corridor is relevant. Uh, uh, Jeff, you have a comment there? Yeah, you're, you're muted, you're muted. We've dealt with the similar issues before and the, the way you do it or the way we have done it in the past is to take a position of, of not uh, basically starting like five feet above uh, the uh, edge of the roadway, the, the elevation there, shooting a line down to the first blue water that you can see and, and making that your line, that that's your view corridor line. And, um, you know, it's, it's I, I'm, I get your point that, you know, you'd be standing there looking out at sky, what's the point of that? But there, it is it is adjustable. Well, and I think by your definition, this represents a violation of that because it would block, I mean, it's not much of it, it's, I don't know, five foot width or approximately, that's it penetrating into the view corridor and blocking a little bit of blue water. Well, Greg, um, you're forgetting you're forgetting the the landscaping also. That five Jeff is correct. This was a huge battle, ten fifteen years, oh, more like fifteen years ago on the silver property on uh, ECH across from uh, the nursery uh, Calvin's, and it went a year and a half, and finally got to coastal, and that's how they determine it. You shoot down. That's why we made them lower the house at the time. But again, that was a decade and a half ago. But it is five feet above. You take a transom, you look at the sky. Because you are correct. If you look straight out anywhere, even standing on the road, you look straight out. Uh, on Coast Highway at 10-foot elevation, you're not going to see water. Yeah. Um, Dennis has his hand Dennis, up. I, Dennis? Dennis? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The roof line is less than 18 feet. What are you guys talking about here? There's it's nothing to talk about. Corridor. Less it's, than a view corridor. it's a view corridor. It's a view corridor. 18 feet. I it's heard there's nothing to do with 18 feet. Yeah. I mean, with uh, 18 feet, it's, nothing at all. It's a, it's not a structure. Right. We, uh, I heard Don Schmitz uh, sort of quietly say at, at some point during his presentation that he was willing to accept whatever conditions we wanted to impose with regard to that view corridor. He might not have meant what I'm talking about, but he has his hand up. Maybe he has a response. Yeah, okay. Let's hear from Don for a moment. Wait for staff to unmute me. Uh, there you go. I wanted to give you the citation. Uh, it is by code in the LIP at 6.5 E2C. Uh, that in the view corridor, anything needs to be below the center line of the frontage road. So that's by code. And, and the special condition. I was, was, <clears throat> repeated, repeated on 6.5 what? 6.5 E2C. And, you know, I thought that the concern that Chair Hill might have was that 
that uh, there was a question in regards to whether or not the design for that section of the home was in fact at or below the center line of, of bird view. And we're certainly happy to redocument that with a specific survey to show that we are uh, in fact consistent with 6.5 E2C, which says that any building in the view corridor must be at or below the center line of the frontage road. I find it hard to believe that that's the only requirement to satisfy for a view quarter. I think part of the, the, the view is the view. And if we're blocking it, then we're blocking any blue water. That seems like that would be significant. Richard, you you were muted. Do you want to say something? Uh, I make sure I'm unmuted there. Um, I believe the section you're talking about, Don, is E1A, if that's correct, because uh, E is uh, ocean views and talks about new development on the ocean side of public roads, not limited to, and it lists bird view. And I think what Don was getting at is when the topography of the site descends from the roadway, new development shall be sited and designed to preserve blue water views over the approved structures by incorporating the following measures. Um, and A is structures shall extend no higher than the, the road grade adjacent to the project. Or feasible, that, but that's separate from a view corridor, right? That's a, it's, it's its own separate designation. That's uh... view corridors are E two, and you, that's in a situation when you are unable to hide the development by going below ro road grade, uh, where the topography of the project site does not s permit siting the design of the structure that is located below road grade. New development shall provide an ocean view corridor on the project site. So why have we provided? So, oh, okay. So we provided the corridor based on the prior designs that were taller. In and that, now, no, no, no. His, his... Go ahead, Jen, yeah, Jeff. It, 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 he, the section he's reading is E2C, which just simply says no portion of any structure shall extend into the view corridor above the elevation of the adjacent street. The, the negative implication is that it can extend into the view corridor below the elevation of the, the elevation of the adjacent street. That's his argument. I'm, I'm not right. espousing that. That's his but argument. You're John? talking about structures and, and it should also cover landscaping. We have plenty of plenty of precedent uh, just right around the corner on uh, cliffside of uh, at the end of Doom Drive, there's a view corridor cut through the bushes down to the ocean that's had been maintained for 15, 20 years. Um, another silver project. Um, well, that's, that's, that's changing the subject from structures to the, to the landscaping is another problem, but it doesn't solve the first problem. Right. The first problem is how to deal with that. Right. Because, again, to just say the view is what's horizontal, that just makes no sense to me. Richard, can you read the uh, the, the special provisions for, uh, what do they call them, uh, important roads? Or uh, bird view is one of those roads? A bird, yeah, yes, and I'm trying to find, uh, so yes to that question, bird view, uh, that's considered a scenic road. It is listed. And DDA... What are the view corridor conditions in the resolution? Because, oh, there it is. Uh, 26, uh, Commissioner Maza, uh, talks about the view corridor, and it also has a condition about landscaping to that we can use to enforce if somebody does plant something that, that blocks the view. And so landscaping would have to uh, adhere to that. Okay, so our landscaping plan shows that. Uh, so uh, since you already have a provision in here, do we have to change the landscaping plan or the, there's 10 foot trees being planted in there? Um, do we have to change the landscaping plan or does this automatically change it? Trevor, to me, I believe this would prohibit us from allowing a 10 foot uh, tree and the reason why I say that is the word the verbiage is any landscaping in this area shall include only low growing species 
still not obscure or block blue water views. Okay, so that, can that be the condition? That is, that is the, the condition. That is the I condition. mean, on the landscaping plan, because we're showing something else. And we're it's, stated, it's stated that will prevent any any kind of landscaping that blocks the blue water view will have to be removed. Okay, so we have to we have to uh, put the, uh, uh, the that in the resolution. It's, yeah, that's it, what they have. It, it's okay. the resolution that governs John and not the plans. It still doesn't solve the inherent question about why a view quarter isn't required to have view. Uh, let's leave that there. I don't know if I would have the votes on that, but we have it in the record now. Um, Can you give us that that section, that code section, on not blocking views with plants? Um, so it's it's condition twenty six in your resolution, and the code section is. Uh, Scroll to the top here, 6.5 E2, uh, sorry, 6.5 E2, and then D is in dog, and it talks about fencing and landscaping, and it specifies there shall only be low-growing species that will not obscure or block blue water views. Okay. Okay. All right, let me go to my last point, and uh, this is for the record because I'm sure I won't get anybody on with me, but I'm the me mechanical room is 340 square feet. It's six feet high. It's developed space. Now, I brought this up previously in a, on a different application, and I was told, well, if it's six feet or under, we don't count that as TDSF. But I went look, and, and I was told there's a policy on that, and I've looked at the policies, Nowhere is there any, is it written anywhere? And I almost wonder if it was that six foot height limitation is a confusion, a confounding with the rule about the six foot overhangs that you don't count, TD, you don't count an overhang, a covered area as TDSF unless it's at least six feet wide. But that's about the width of the overhang, not about the height of the space. To me, that six feet space is finished, it's developed, it's, it's development. If a wall is development, then certainly a finished space has development area in it. And the significance here is it's, if it's about 340 square feet, that puts them over TDSF by about 300 square feet. So I, I know nobody's gonna go along with me on that, but it just, it just seems like a, if we're going with the code and what the language says, I don't see a rule against counting that as TDSF. The reason for six feet was that previous planning directors were tasked to come up with an, some sort of limit to what these areas would be because we were finding uh, crawl spaces under homes, uh, areas clearly not intended to be habitable. And so where the six foot number came from is when you look at the definition of floor area, mm -hmm. it's specifically says areas, and this is under commercial now, uh, it identifies that areas that do not have a ceiling height of uh, ceiling height of less than six feet are not considered floor area. And the other support to that was also in the building code and areas with the ceiling height of less than six feet were considered or are considered to be non-habitable areas. They're not areas that could be counted towards that. So that is why the previous directors have established six feet. Uh, it was based on those two. Uh, th that way they weren't just picking something random out of the air, like three or four feet. This could at least relate back to the building code and something in our municipal code. Okay, again, for the record, uh, in my appeal of a TDSF decision to the Coastal Commission, they expressly distinguished that floor area is not the measurement used for TDSF. Floor area is the measurement used for, uh, what, what's the other, uh, for two thirds rule. You use floor area for two thirds rule and, but TDSF is a separate thing. So I think we're doing it wrong here. I don't expect that I'm gonna pull everybody along here with me at 1053, but we have it in the record now. John? Yeah, I just wanna comment that 
we should have we have an LIP interpretation manual, and we should have these things in it so we don't yeah. have to do this over and over and over again. Yeah, uh, it's not that tough to write an interpretation. Okay, do I hear uh, any kind of uh, motion on this? Well, uh, I can start off. Well, I want to add a couple things. Um, uh, I guess I can start the motion uh, to uh, approve the project uh, with condition number 25 um, change to the standard language of uh, fences in non-rural areas. And Richard can tell you what code section that is. Uh, it's in all our things. Um, I want to add uh, lands landscaping shall follow under under the approval of the landscaping plan, which I've got to find here. Uh, is that the same section? No, that's anyway in the landscaping section. I don't know what number you would add. I would say a uh, landscaping plan shall be uh, altered to to uh, follow section 6.5.E.2.D. Um, and then uh, that takes care of that. Uh, I have one quick question, and that is of staff, or actually Didier, uh, the the photos of the site and the site show a large hedge in front of, on, on the highway and a giant tree. And Don said the tree is being removed. Is that hedge going to be removed and put into compliance? And is that in our, and is that in our resolution? Because I don't it's remember a, it say anything that said actually the tree was going to go. I just heard it. There's supposed to cut down all the foliage in the front on the street, Commissioner Mazza. But that's in our resolution? No, that's not specifically listed in the resolution, but the applicant has advice that that's what they were going to do during our project review, so we can just add it for yeah, the measure. I'd like to add that uh, front, uh, street side foliage will be removed and replaced with code compliant. Is it a hedge DDA that's in the street? Well, it's, it's just it's just overgrown landscaping. It's not like a precise hedge. It's just a lot of different foliage there. Because condition forty eight addresses any vegetation that's creating an impermeable condition serving the same function of a fence shall be trimmed to forty two inches. Okay. Right. Now, what about is there anything in there? So I don't need to put that in. But is there anything in there about the removal of the tree? Not about the tree. Okay, I'd like to add that as a condition that I don't know how you identify a tree, but the big giant tree. Fair enough. <laughs> it is a big giant tree, correct. Okay. I think it'd be interesting to see him try to build a house around the tree. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. Got a nice atrium. Uh, and then uh, I'm open for, well, Anybody second it? I'm open for uh, am other amendments. If so, nobody seconds it, then... I'll second it. I, I would like to have um, um, Trevor repeat the the reference, the code reference again, because I'm not sure. You, you rattle it off pretty quickly, uh, John, and I want to make sure that I understand exactly which provision you're talking about. I... I... I have it down as landscaping must comply with LIP section 6.5.E.2.D. 6.5.E, uh, 6.5E, right? That's what I have. E2. Um, E2. E2. D. Go ahead. Huh? The e last two. is a D, is in dog. And that's the numbers that Richard gave me. Now, I, I forgot. One. Okay, so what that reads is, just, just to make sure that you understand it too, John, any fencing across the view corridor shall be visually permeable, and any landscaping in this area 
shall include only low growing species that will not obscure or block blue water views. That's what you were looking for. Correct. Okay. I did, and I don't know if any, I can amend it, but I did want to have the same conditions as the prior, prior uh, merit as far as the uh, three year, three time penalty if you get caught three times on those two issues. I think we have one of them in, but not the other. And I don't want to take the time to look it all up, but I don't know if that's permissible or if anybody, if I can amend it. Uh, uh, Richard, do you know if it has these, if it has the, uh, the the three strikes condition on the landscaping and the lighting? Check in now. Can we just say if it doesn't? It, I see condition, 40, condition 48 says three violations of this condition will result in a requirement to permanently remove the vegetation from site. So it looks like you have it. Do we have it for the head? Yes. It's also for the lighting and landscaping. Okay, great. Okay. And it, it looks like, uh, Commissioner Maza, that uh, 48 actually covers what you were looking to add. You're saying the landscaping that serves as a fence shall be trimmed not to exceed 42 inches. It already says here that vegetation forming a permeable, impermeable condition serving the same function as a fence or wall, also known as a hedge located within the side or rear yard setback, shall be maintained at a height of uh, six feet. And a hedge located within the front yard setback will be maintained or below a height of 42 inches. Does that match what you were looking for? <laughs> that's Land different. That's not that, that's, that's not a view corridor specific yeah, provision. That's that's, that's true. I, I know we already had the view corridor with 6.5.E.2.D, point point e point but he had a separate one that he requested about the uh I, I believe that Commissioner Raza wanted us to target the tree specifically. I had that one as an additional one also. I, I did not read that other one. I changed it to the 6.5.2 point whatever. Okay, goes. that was the intention. Thank yeah. you. And, and uh, okie dokie, that's my motion. Any uh, uh, Anything else from anybody? Yeah, I, I just want to say for the record, I found one other, well, the, the survey map that I'm referring to that I can't find is because it was in one of the geology reports that I didn't print out. So it's it, digital on my computer. But I also found... Um, and this is just for the record, Ken, you might care about this. Um, the way the bluff edge was calculated, um, and this there's, it, there's a graph shown in the Addendum Engineering Geological Report, January 5th, 2019, Geologic Section AA, page 26. There's a map that shows uh, sort of schematically where they have Top, called the top of bluff and the 50 foot setback and the top of bluff line is actually down the slope it's not at the top and uh similarly don schmitz's presentation when you look back at the video you'll see the way they've drawn it you can see this the slope of the bluff curving down and the top of bluff mark is somewhat down lower than that so um with that said I think we need to go ahead with. Uh, a, are you, Craig, are you making an amendment saying to follow that particular map? No, I'm I'm putting that in the record because I don't expect that I have three votes to deny the project on that basis. Okay. Anybody else? You could actually call the roll. Uh, if I could, real quick though, I want to clarify something. One of Commissioner Maza's concerns. Uh, was condition 25, he wanted a regular, because that goes to split rail. Um, Commissioner Maza also asked that we include a condition, just the fencing in general, uh, the, to be compliant with the city's general fencing requirements, uh, six feet in the side yards and rear and, and right. in front. Condition 23 says the height of fences and walls shall comply with LIP section 3.5 Point three A, and then it goes on to say no retaining wall shall exceed six feet. But um, the three point five three A and its subsections are all of our fencing guidelines. Okay, uh, so then uh, I'd like to amend my motion to eliminate uh, condition number twenty five. Does that fix it? Yeah. yeah. What's and what can you identify the tree that's to be removed? Is there a, 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 an easy description we can use for that? Yeah, the gigantic tree that's 10 <laughs> times bigger than anything else in the lot. Big tree that would otherwise be in the middle of a house. Okay. 
The tree that exceeds 18 feet. Is that are there any others that exceed 18 feet? All right, let's let's are we ready to call the roll? Well, we, I need a second. I need an approval on that eliminating uh 25. Can I can I just uh, I'll, I'll read what I have for the motion and then if you could both confirm that it matches what you would want and 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 then the second can confirm too. I believe that what you're looking for is a uh, staff's recommendation with the following modifications. The first is that condition 25 be removed. The second is that a new condition be added saying that landscaping must comply with LIP section 6.5.E.2.D. Point 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 and then add a condition that says um, the tree that is exceeds 18 feet on site shall be removed. Does that accurately ref reflect your motion, Commissioner Mazza? Well, I'm so confused now. I only made three. Is that correct, Craig? Yes. I, I think that sounds right. Okay. That's my motion. Okay. I'll, I'll adopt that. Can we call the roll? Commissioner Mazza. Yes. Uh, strangely enough, I'm going to abstain because I don't think we have the expertise to uh, deal with arguing professional geologists on anything. So let somebody higher up decide that. Chair Hill. Your, your vote was to abstain? Yes. Chair Hill. No. Chair Jennings. I'm not chair anymore, but yes. Oh, sorry <laughs> about that, Commissioner Jennings. Vice Chair Smith? Yes. Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Okay. So the yeah. eyes the oh, eyes have it. Uh John's had hand first, yeah. Uh, um, I'd like to make a motion to continue uh what was it five, uh, five the Latigo item? Yes, to uh, date certain, if the staff would uh, give us a date. Can I, I was going to do that too, Commissioner Mazza. Can we do them on the 11th? These are fire rebuild people, and now it's another month for them to sit through all this. Yeah, I, I w I'd be inclined to just pull ahead tonight if anybody else feels Absolutely like it. Absolutely not. It is, it's 11.10, and we 11.07, we have a 10.30 cutoff. Every okay. time we violate that. Point taken. We we screw up. Can we take and can, but can can we do the eleventh everyone for them? Is that the same date as the other meeting? Is yes, that, that would be the special meeting. The uh, date of the special meeting for the hotel or motel. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, let me ask you this, Richard. Uh, that's gonna be a mondo meeting. Uh, we would have to put this at the back of that meeting. Wouldn't you? It's a fire rebuild. Why would we have to put it at the back? Well, if we're expecting right. Mondo crowds to show up on the for the big thing, I don't know. Yeah, but that's fine. Do them first. It's a fire rebuild. There's not much to talk about here. Oh, there's a huge amount to talk about. This is a yeah, major a lot. policy thing. <laughs> major. It has well, grandfathering and and code sections and all. It'll take at least an hour minimum. So the motion is. What was the date we continued the others to? 18. I, I I would say 18th is, you know, it's six days later, seven days later. Well, you're not the one out of a house. Uh, there's, I, I understand a couple hundred people that are out of a house. Well, then, then you should understand. <laughs> All right, what's the motion? My motion is the, uh, the 18th. Motion is to continue item 5B to January, the regular meeting set for January 18th in the Planning Commission, correct? Correct. Richard, will that work with you? I know you you already kicked some things off of that to fit the other things. Um, I think we're going to end up in there. Here's, uh, we moved two items, if I'm not mistaken, to that already. Yeah. We have 23 requests for extensions for nonconformities on fire rebuilds that I was going to uh, put on that agenda for you. So I'm a little concerned that with those 23 requests and the two we've already moved, uh, we, I mean, obviously we put this on there and if you can't have 
three hearings that night, then something would get bumped. But um, what, we, would, would it make sense to put some of those extension requests on the 11th? I don't think we should put anything on the 11th. This is a special I, meeting. And, uh, unless we have an afternoon session or something prior to this one. Uh, now, Richard, how long does a well, 23, 23 separate hearings you're talking about? So these are extensions of time. That's that's ours, right? Just to just to do our disclosures and blah 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 blah. It's, you know, John, probably and, a lot. And, and are we going to get a staff report this big again? I hope not. Okay. Well, I would suggest that maybe you shouldn't do twenty three. I, I, I put the ones we continue first, and uh, and. Uh, we're going to have to extend some of them because 23 times 15 or whatever it takes per one is a lot. Great. We're going, we're going to have to extend a lot more than that. <laughs> well, why don't you take, why don't you take the three things we have proposed now to continue and take half of the extension items and stick them on the back for the 18th, and put the other half off. Um, Trevor, I don't know if we want to get into a discussion of how we'll do it that night, but we are, I am working with Trevor so that we'd be able to do something uh, that allows you to, to look at these. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I would recommend that you just continue this item to the, if you want to put it as soon as possible, put on the 18th and then, um, you know, Richard can, can look into, you know, staff can recommend continuing items, whichever is the, okay, the least but, pressing. Uh, I, I, was John's, that was John's motion and I'll second that. Yeah, and yeah. I'd like to just, on top of that, just recommend to staff that the items we continue tonight are one, two, and three at that meeting. Well, I, I think I, I wouldn't recommend doing that because I think there are items that these these extensions need to be you know put up front and some need to be dealt with right away. Before let's A, put, 4, B, and 4, C. At least let's put Tomlinson up front because they, as Dennis has said, they're also Woolsey. We need to, we need to hear them. Okay, that's my motion. So the motion is to continue the item to um, item 5B to um, January 18th, regular meeting of the Planning Commission, correct? Correct. Correct. Roll call. Commissioner Mossa? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Wetton? Yes. Vice Chair Smith? I guess so. Yes. Chair Hill? Yes. Motion carries. Motion to adjourn uh, in honor of DDA. <laughs> That's, that sounds a little grim. <laughs> He's dead to us. <laughs> He's not dead to us. He was a loyal employee. He's <laughs> a good man. Daddy-A. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll second the motion. Here's to you, buddy. Good luck. Yeah. Go get them. Fix fix your audio on your computer. Hey, can we vote and go? Yeah, we can take we take roll. Roll call, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Chair Hill. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Wetton. Yes. Vice Chair Smith. Yes. Thank you, every thank you, everybody. We'll try to be more uh, efficient next time. Um, and thanks for uh, reading my mind, Patricia. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Aloha. Aloha. How do I leave? Uh...